Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Ventura County Planning Commission. If we get too loud and there's too much feedback, again, we apologize. We've put some new technology up here. So um, there will be no workers' comp complaints filed. At this time, I'd like to call to order the Planning Commission meeting. Please rise and face the flag. Place your hand over your heart and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. How's that? There we go. Uh, at this time, I'd like the clerk to please call the roll. Commissioner Calley. Commissioner Dukas? Here. Commissioner Onstott? Here. Commissioner Westner? Present. Commissioner Rodriguez? Here. All right, please let the record reflect that we have a full commission this morning. Item number four is public comments. Public comments is the section of the agenda for any citizen wishing to speak to the, the commission, uh, not for items already agendized understand uh, under the government code commonly known as the Brown Act, we can receive the uh, information. We may ask uh, informational questions, but we cannot take action because it has not been noticed to the public. Is there anybody who has, wants to speak before us other than the agenda items? Okay. Hearing none, uh, we'll move on to the acceptance of the minutes. Move adoption of the minutes of, what is it, July 30th, 2015. All right. Let's stop right here because the motion thing so oh, there we go. okay so you need to click on the <laughs> yes is that correct okay, okay. And no second uh, did you click, okay and uh, there's okay okay I'm confused we lost, the screen. We lost our screen The voting came up before the yeah. Okay. What do I need to do? All, all I have is motion. No, it's the. You need to say. Okay, now it's up. All right. Now we need to. Who's going to second? Okay. I'll, I'll second that. Yeah, no second reader. Thank you. All right. All please vote. I voted pretty much. You already. Go ahead. This is to make us more efficient, right? That's crazy. All right, we approve the minutes. Um, I want to compliment uh, both staff and the clerk for the uh, intense notif notice information that you provided for the exceptions for that project. <laughs> I didn't know I could be that articulate. All right, <laughs> we'll move on to a consent calendar item number 5A. Consent calendar is just routine in nature, however, if any member of the staff or the Planning Commissioner would like to withdraw. Uh, please say so at this time. If not, um, I'll need a motion to approve the consent calendar. Commissioner Wessner? Yes. I have a question. Okay. I notice, I notice there's a CUP number under consent calendar. Mm -hmm. um, yet it asks us uh, if we want to discuss it, we can call it out. Right. There's no description of what it is. If I, real quickly, I think it, it was it, just an extension that was given by, okay, by staff. So it's just correctly. a procedural thing. It's not right. Okay, thank no. you. It's a change of ownership. I'm sorry. That's that. Thank you very much. It's early in the morning. I'm still okay. not function. Okay. So it's just a matter of change, notice okay. of change of ownership. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so I need a motion for approve the consent calendar. I'll make a motion. We approve the consent calendar. Okay. Hang on. Okay. okay. Uh, second. I'll second the motion. Okay. All right. Now we get the vote. There we go. Wasn't that fun? 
Okay. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one of the reasons we're, um, I know I had been requested by staff to reorder the agenda as far as the other, but I don't feel it's appropriate, particularly since somebody may anticipate that item being later and show up. So uh, uh, I'm, I don't feel it's comfortable. That. So we'll move on now with item number six, uh, PL 13-0154. Uh, revolving uh, around determination to condition use permit uh, by the planning director. Uh, I have, would like at this point to, like to turn it over to county council to because of the issue that we have been requested to continue the item. Jeff. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so the, uh, there's been a request for a continuance in this matter, and so the, um, the appropriate procedure will be should be for your commission to um, to hear both sides in terms of the continuous continuance request before proceeding to the merits and and the merits of the matter involve an appeal of a notice of violation and also uh, an appeal to planning division's decision to um, terminate processing of a CUP application and for the record I represent the planning commission I do not represent the planning division in this matter when matters involve um, a notice of violation um, I, my office um, will either assign two attorneys, one to represent the planning division and one to represent the planning commission, or in this case, I'll just represent the planning commission and the planning division is on its own. So um, just for the record, I'm, I'm your attorney today. I'm not the planning division's attorney. <laughs> so staff realizes they're flying without benefit of counsel. Is that correct? No way, ma'am. That's correct. Thank you. <clears throat> Let the record note that. All right. Um, given the situation, this was a request by the applicant for the continuance, they, them, they being the moving party. Uh, I'm going to go a little out of order and then have, allow staff to respond to the request for continuance. So at this time, if the representative for the applicant would like to step forward and present, Mr. Worth. Your name for the record, sir. information concerning a continuance at the earliest possible time. I, I'm sorry, I, I'm getting some feedback. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, I had requested from staff a continuance at the earliest possible time. I'm relatively new to uh, uh, this action, having been retained only within the last month. Um, and I was informed uh, by Ms. Boero that, uh, in fact, uh, we would have to make this uh, request to the Planning Commission. Um, having served on private boards, not public boards, but having served on boards myself, I know that there is a great deal of time taken by members of the board in preparing, reading over the staff reports and so on, and so I wanted to make sure that my request got in at the earliest possible moment before all the members of the commission, which is why a few days ago at the beginning of the week, I submitted a letter directly to uh, Mr. Wessner and asked that it be communicated to the members of the commission so that in the event that the members of the commission were so inclined, they would not have to spend the time to work up the 300 and some odd pages uh, of material that were included in the staff report. Uh, I have seen this morning uh, a letter that was apparently um, uh, sent out last night, although it looks like it's dated October 1, uh, from Ms. Boero uh, uh, opposing our request for a continuance um, I don't want to belabor the issues. I simply want to respond to those items very briefly. Um, we had enunciated three specific grounds on which the continuance was requested. One I have alluded to, which is the staff report is extraordinarily detailed, filled with evidence, and we wanted additional time uh, to respond to that in a way that would not be helter-skelter, slapdash, whatever uh, uh, adjective you want to attach to it, 
uh, but in a manner that would be consistent with the methodical nature of the staff report and be able to put forth our case uh, effectively. This is particularly important, I might add, because of the fact that the standard for this appeal is de novo consideration. And so it is incumbent on us as the appellants to really have everything that we need, all of our ducks lined up, before it uh, goes to a decision before the uh, commission. The second reason that I enunciated uh, in, in our request was that we have, in fact, been making a good faith attempt uh, to resolve the issue. I, I'm sure the members of the Planning Commission are aware that the somewhat extraordinary step has been taken in this case of not only having the CUP proceeding that we're engaged in here uh, uh, ongoing, but also there is a criminal prosecution uh, that is um, uh, pending as well. Um, and because of the fact uh, that there are two agencies of county government involved in what is now an enforcement action in addition to the CUP application, we thought it best to try and get all of the parties in the same room to sit down, see if all of these issues could not be resolved because it's clear to us that the county's interest here is in enforcing uh, the, the regulations, enforcing the, uh, 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 the CUP application process, uh, and making sure that items proceed in a methodical manner. Um, and so we felt the best way to do that would be by getting all the players in one room. Um, I spoke with the district attorney who agreed to run point on this, uh, uh, Ms. Mae Fox. And I made my request near the beginning of September. I floated a number of dates, six or seven dates at that time. Um, I note in Ms. Boero's uh, response that she indicates we had only floated October 1 and October 2. In, in fact, by the time that I heard back from Ms. Fox, those were the only dates of the original dates I had given before this hearing that were uh, available. Um, so in fact, uh, as a postscript to all of this, we have uh, made arrangements as of yesterday afternoon, I finally heard back from Ms. Fox, that a meeting will be set up on October 7th at 9 a.m. Uh, here in, in the county offices uh, with members of the RMA staff and members of the district attorney in an effort to resolve this. So the good faith attempt that we have made is ongoing. Um, I also note that this is not a situation where a continuance is going to present any danger to health and safety. Uh, the property is no longer being rented out. There are no events taking place. There, there is uh, uh, no activity whatsoever on the property other than uh, a, a caretaker who is uh, in residence. Uh, um, and um, uh, so we, we are talking about a situation where uh, the brief continuance should not present any prejudice uh, to, to anyone. Um, finally, uh, and along the lines uh, of what I was saying a moment ago about the pendency of two different actions, one in, in the criminal proceeding and one in, in, uh, uh, before this board, um, it is important to note that my clients who are being sued criminally uh, would of necessity be forced into a position of waiving important uh, rights, uh, procedural rights that they have in the criminal context if they want to proceed with the civil proceeding. I don't want my clients to be put in that situation. And from my understanding uh, of, of this board's processes, that's not something you're looking for either. So uh, based on all of the foregoing, uh, I would respectfully request a continuance um, uh, of uh, approximately 60 days. Hopefully, uh, in that time, we will be able to work out with the county offices, both in the district attorney's uh, uh, end and uh, uh, also uh, before uh, this board and the RMA, uh, all of the kinks that have uh, developed here. Um, I, I do want to say one final word about the criminal proceeding. I, I note that Ms. Boero, in her response to us, has stated in a couple of places that the criminal proceeding is really a separate proceeding. And, and I have to 
say that while I agree with that in theory, as a practical matter, the fact is that the same underlying allegations of violation um, uh, pertain to both uh, uh, sets of proceedings. And so I, I think it really is incumbent uh, upon the Planning Commission to take a step back, allow us the time necessary to get all of our ducks in order and be able to make the kind of presentation that we need in both uh, forums and hopefully to resolve this without the necessity of going further. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'm open. Any questions of Dana? Yeah. Just to counsel? <clears throat> Excuse me, sir. When were you retained? I have represented Ms. Vodinos in a number of matters, uh, probably for about a year. I was retained for this specific matter, I would say, the first week in September. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any other questions, counsel? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before I have staff come up, uh, Madam Clerk, look at what our dates we have in January in case we should go to that direction. You don't have to respond right now. Okay. Uh, staff? Thank you, sir. Chair Westner, Commissioners, uh, Christina Borrell, planning staff. Thank you. So we're going to respond um, to the continuance request by the um, appellant's legal counsel. Uh, you do have a memo, uh, which is uh, Exhibit 20, um, dated today's date, and it has our um, points on why the request, the request for the continuance should be denied. So I'll briefly just go over the highlights of that. Um, the appellant had ample time to review the staff report. Uh, the planning division publishes all of their staff reports for public hearings on our planning division website um, no later than one week before the scheduled hearing. And there's no new information from what was from when the time that the staff report was published to today's date. So the you know the appellant did have ample time to review um, and ask any questions of, of us, but that was not uh, the case. Um, and as Mr. Spitzer alluded to, um, the criminal charges with the, the district attorney are not subject to this appeal. The appeal today is of the termination of the CEP application and the appeal of the notice of violation for having um, conducting temporary outdoor events on the site without a CEP. Um, efforts to take care of the criminal charges um, are irrelevant with regards to with regards to granting this continuance, and also. Um, as I mentioned, the events did did have occurred on the site after the CEP was terminated, which we'll talk about in our in um, in our presentation today if we if we do get that far. And the appellant actually agreed to this hearing date on August 20th of this year, and the appellant only requested a continuance in writing to staff on September 19th, and there was no eff effort made by the appellant um, during. Uh, either the August 20th time or the September 19th time to um, have a meeting and resolve these issues. Um, and also, um, as Mr. Spencer said, uh, to my knowledge, we only, I only received um, the two dates of October 1st and October 2nd as possible dates for a hearing, uh, a meeting, excuse me. So there are also alternative situations that are afforded to the appellant um, in consideration of the CEP application. Um, if the planning committee, if your commission does decide today to appeal, upheld the appeals, then the uh, then we do have the staff has to continue processing the CEP. Um, if we do have the hearing today, and your your commission denies the appeals, then the appeal decision to the then the appellant can appeal the decision to the board, and they can direct um, staff to continue processing the CEP. Um, and also, um, if the appeals are denied today, um, and we do have the hearing. Um, and as well as, and if that's the case at the board as well, then um, the applicants can submit a new CEP application after that time period. So in conclusion, um, for those points, staff recommends that you deny the request for continuance. Questions of staff? Yes. Commissioner Antoine? When was the staff report, when was the staff report published? September 24th. September 24th. I don't recall that while we read it. Is it 311 pages? Well, that's okay. <laughs> there about. It's very voluminous, yes. <laughs> okay. Is there anything in that staff report which wasn't personally discussed between the applicant and the planning department? 
Anything new? No. Is there any evidence that the applicant is continuing to operate the uh, property in, in violation of the, of the uh, C, well, we don't have a CUP, in violation of the planning or, or the zoning ordinances now? Um, to planning staff's knowledge, no, but you could, um, we do have planning uh, code compliance staff here who can um, address that question. Can, can you answer that question? Do we have any knowledge of any continued violations? The only, excuse me, uh, Commissioner Wester, Commissioner Lonstadt, uh, the only information I have regarding that is I spoke with uh, Marie Mason from the Santa Susana Knowles uh, Homeowners Association last night. She said, unfortunately, she couldn't make it to the hearing today. She just got back from out of town yesterday. Um, the Knowles folks are watching this very closely, and she wanted to state that um, she just wanted to convey that uh, she felt she wanted to be here, but she couldn't. But long-winded way of saying that she informed me yesterday, I have not corroborated this, but anecdotally said there, were, there was a recent event. Um, I do see, I believe that there's some neighbors um, who live within the vicinity of the property here. Perhaps they have some knowledge of an event. Um, besides that, we don't know of any that we, we could confirm or deny at this point in time. Thank you. I believe you said that the, the request for continuance was presented September 20th? The applicant uh, submitted an email to myself as the case planner and requested a continuance. And um, since the um, legal notice had already been published in the paper, uh, we planning division could not, um, we could not um, hold, a, you know, have a continuance of the hearing. So I did convey that to um, the appellant. Was the request for continuance uh, presented by Mr. Spitzer? No, it was, it was conveyed by Mr. Pipolo, who's, the, um, who's involved with the property. Do you have, regarding the joint meeting that is to take place between the district attorney's office and, and the parties, the planning mm -hmm. division, that's, that is scheduled? Um, is that correct? To my knowledge, it, uh, it has been. Is there an agenda for that meeting? Uh, no, not, not as of today. What prejudice would befall the county of Ventura and the neighbors there if this matter were continued for 60 days? I can direct that to planning yeah. staff. I can't speak to any prejudice, but what I will say is that um, I, I think we have to back up here. Um, there's two very simple questions that are before you. Uh, number one, did the planning director err with regard to uh, terminating the CUP application after the three incompleteness determinations, um, which indicated that the application was grossly incomplete? Number two, second question is, did they have the events that were the subject of the notice of violation? Those are very simple questions. We don't see the need for continuing this hearing. It seems like that could be resolved and decided at this point in time. You've got to keep in mind the appellants requested this hearing in terms of they filed the appeal. They challenged this, these decisions. And this is their opportunity to get before you and uh, state their case. And once again, these are very simple matters. We don't see uh, why uh, this needs to be continued. Um, and with regard to that, there, as you read in the staff report, there's a long history of violations that have occurred. Um, a number of events have occurred. There are building violations on the property. Um, and meanwhile, we were making requests to, and providing them with very specific direction, detailed direction on how they could complete their CUP application such that they could conduct these events uh, legitimately. And from what we could see, they just were not listening to us and taking it seriously. I mean, every time we received a submittal, it would be a partial submittal where they would address just a few of the items that we requested in order to complete the application. Um, and it was only after times where we said, hey, what's going on with this application? We would check in with the, uh, well, the applicants at that point in time that they would actually take any sort of action on the CP um, application. And in addition to that, they fell behind in their payments um, for uh, the bills for the processing of the CUP application. All of these actions just indicated to us that they weren't really taking the CUP application seriously, especially given the fact that they continued to have these events despite the fact that the Code Compliance Division staff made it explicitly clear they are not to conduct those events until they get the CUP application um, approved. 
by your commission. So thank you, thank you. That's yeah. assuming the staff recommendation is upheld. Is there any sanction for reapplying for the CUP? Negative. So what we'd be directing uh, them to do, and this is with. We'd be discussing this as a part of the uh, meeting that the deputy DA is trying to set up. Right now, it's tentatively set for October 7th. Uh, we received emails yesterday, so we haven't seen an agenda. We're just, we're just trying to find a date where we can all meet. And at that meeting, we'd be telling them, okay, this is the procedure. And what we'd be directing them to do is they've seen the list of items that they need to supplement what they've already submitted in order to give us an application that we can process and present to your commission for consideration. We'd say, take a look at that letter. Do you have any questions about the submittal requirements at that point, this point in time? We try to answer those to the best of our ability. And at that point, they could go ahead, put together the application, resubmit, and then we could go ahead and process it. And um, if there are any violations that exist at that point in time, we would discuss with co-compliance staff and then also the deputy DA and then our legal counsel, who wouldn't be Mr. Barnes, um, whether or not uh, we could enter into a compliance agreement to process the application if they made a diligent effort to uh, abate all of the violations on the property, such as the building violations that exist. So. Thank you. I have no further questions. Any other questions of staff at this time? Uh, I have a question. Commissioner Rodriguez. Uh, since we're talking about activities that have gone on, may I ask uh, the deputy to come forward to sit in the back of the room? I have a question. Is the deputy part of this matter? Yes, he's, 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 he's uh, uh, there's information that's been submitted in the report that involves sheriff's records and Okay, this will affect your ability to decide to continue or not? Yes. Okay, keep it the scope of the questions as far as the merits. Good morning. Good morning. It's been a while since I've, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm uh, Senior Deputy Mark Cardinal with the Ventura County Sheriff's Department. Okay. It's been a while since I've dealt with uh, dispatch records, but everything is digitized, is that correct, on all call, calls for service? Yes, sir. And it includes uh, reporting parties? Yes. And that information is available readily uh, here at Sheriff's Department if it's needed? Yes. Um, our reports, and I don't know if you if you submitted the original reports that we have in our, our uh, records here, but uh, they list calls for service starting at that address on... Uh, Santa Zana Knowles Road, um, I think it was 2011, um, and they stop approximately end of May, May 30th, I believe. Um, do you have the ability to tell us whether there's been any other calls for service beyond that May 30th date? The last call for service that we received was on June 28th, 2015. It was about 8.09 p.m. Reference of a party disturbance call at the address. June? June 28th. Okay. Nothing since then? No. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Mr. Spitzer, I'll be certainly entertained uh, follow-up since you're the appealing party. Thank you. Let me respond briefly to uh, a couple of comments that were made by the staff. Uh, indeed, there have been three determinations of incompleteness, the last of which was uh, in uh, late May, May 28th, when the uh, CUP application was terminated. Um, I will represent to the members of the Planning Commission, and you can see for, for, uh, for yourselves by an examination of the May 28th letter, which, if necessary, we're going to get to, there are items there that never appeared before on any of the other uh, determinations of incompleteness. Um, the, in addition to which, the determination of incomplete, uh, incompleteness from the first two submissions uh, is challenged, as well as the third one, because subsequent submissions were made that addressed virtually all of the items that are on that list. So for, um, uh, for the staff to say that there was some sort of an, an egregious, outrageous, I'm, I, I, I'm, I don't remember the exact term that was used, um, uh, 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 flagrant uh, 
um, uh, 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 shortfall in terms of the compliance with uh, the determination, um, I, I, I simply have to take issue with that. And if necessary, we'll get into that factually, but I don't believe that uh, it is substantiated by the facts. Um, as to the request for a continuance, I know Mr. Peeplow did make a request for a continuance, and I myself spoke with Ms. Boero and emailed her as well, requesting a continuance about the same time, uh, shortly after the 20th of September, right around in there. Um, my information is that there has been no leasing of the property since the end of May 2015. I have no idea uh, what the um, uh, June 28 uh, issue was, and I don't believe that there is a notation uh, from June 28 in the call log that was presented to us as part of the staff report's evidence. With regard to the CUP application itself and some of the um, violations or, or incompleteness items, I, I want to represent to the members of the commission that my client has not stopped the process of addressing all of these items. There have been ongoing communications with code enforcement, uh, with the Department of Building and Safety, and uh, with um, uh, other, other parts of the RMA to address the issues. And if we, if we need to, we'll get into that. There was an issue about a tree and removal of a portable restroom, that all has been addressed. Uh, whatever building issues uh, were involved with a glass uh, sunroom on the property, those have all been addressed and finaled. My, my clients have not stopped their efforts to develop the property and bring it into compliance. So I don't want the members of the commission to think that we were just sitting back on our hands and doing nothing. Uh, I would simply uh, uh, ask, uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, of the commission, that, uh, uh, that in the interest of fairness uh, and in the interest of getting this resolved, um, uh, that the continuance be granted. I think you can see that there are a great number of facts in dispute. M Mr. Onstad asked about the actual page number. There are 311 pages in the staff report. Uh, and, and so I want an opportunity to be able to respond to all of those allegations in a systematic, methodical manner. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> all right, we've heard both sides uh, as far as the matter continues to, to go any further. I feel it would be a matter of delving into the merits of the matter. Commissioners? Oh, I, I'm sorry. To I'm sorry. I should have said this at the beginning. I apologize. So the standard um, for your commission to decide whether or not to grant the commission uh, the request for conti continuance is good cause. And so that's uh, just generally speaking, courts, California courts have found that uh, good cause means that there's a factual explanation of a reasonable ground for the continuance. And so it's a pretty general standard, but good cause is the standard and it's um, squarely within your commission's discretion to decide either way. Thank you. Commissioner Winston. Yes, Commissioner. It, it, it would be um, my, pre it's, it's my judgment that um, given that, uh, that this is an appeal of a planning director decision, that there has been ample time for the, um, the facts of the case to be reviewed by the um, appellant's representative. And I would like to move forward today and not grant the continuance. Okay. Other commissioner comments? Yeah, I have another question. When was the hearing set and people got notice of it? Was there no notice to the applicant prior to that, that the hearing would be set for that date? Was there any discussion yes. regarding that? Um, when uh, determining when the date of the appeal hearing would be, yes. um, I did give Mr. Peeplo um, several dates, and one of them was October 1st, and that worked with his schedule as well as ours. So he agreed to the October 1st date. Thank you. 
Any other commissioner comments? Hearing not, uh, what is the pleasure of the, this board? Well, how do we do the good one? Okay. Do we, is, it a, is it a motion to deny? Yeah. deny? yeah. Okay. So, I move to deny the continuance and move forward. Okay, Commissioner Dukas, do I have a second? I'll second. Commissioner Kelly. As soon as it comes up, please vote. So a yes is a no. Uh, yeah, so you mean the motion was to deny the continuance. While we're tallying, I have an editorial comment. A staff report 311 pages long one week prior to a hearing doesn't seem an altogether adequate. But under these circumstances, as reflected in all the discussions and all the testimony, I'm supporting Norrit's motion. Okay. All right. Any other comments before we continue? Please vote. I would. Oh, I would. Uh, I would support the motion. Also, I'm. A, I have some issues that I. As it relates to how code enforcement has moved forward uh, mm -hmm. on a parallel track, uh, but as it relates to the action of the planning commissioner on this issue, I don't have any problem with the procedural action that's occurred at this point. I think I'm prepared to go forward with the vote. Okay. All right, let's move forward with the vote so we can continue the meeting. Please vote. Yes to deny. Deny the Canadian. Or was right. Yes means no. We need an English teacher up here with a double negative issue. Hmm. Interesting. We're getting there. <laughs> Technical difficulties. I had this experience yesterday in my office with two computers. Thank God I had a smartphone. Should be backlit by cartoons. <laughs> so, so we're back on so the agenda. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we we'll probably wait for that. Uh, the, the request has been denied. Five zero. It's at this point in time to allow the applicant, appellant rather, to uh, prepare. Uh, I'd like to take a ten-minute recess. Get back here at nine thirty, so we can proceed with the hearing. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the delay. Uh, if you're listening at home, but just people in the audience, there are people that are actually watching us and listening to us. We took in an extended um, recess due to the fact that the appellant's attorney pre presented us with a fairly lengthy document. Uh, so the commission took the extra time to review the document. We understand that uh, our attorney has received a copy and has our st the staff for the county. And they've had an opportunity to review the document. All right. Um, anybody? Okay, everybody's good to go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have two things before us. First item today is uh, item 6, PL 13-1054, which is an appeal by the planning director's determination to terminate conditional use per application, PL 13-0154. Uh, just so everybody know what the ground rules are. <clears throat> this is a de novo hearing. We can hear review the data as we choose. So the uh, procedure will be we will have staff present the technical facts that have been developed. The appellant uh, will then be uh, have their opportunity to present their case. Uh, at that point in time, we standard procedure is appointed by the Board of Supervisors is that we hear anybody that supports the appellant. After those bodies, we will hear those that oppose the appellant now, there'll be a little bit of confusion because the staff report recommends denial of the appeal. So uh, we'll try to keep that, that straight as we go down the rules. And then it, it, the appellant will be the last to be heard. So you will have the last rebuttal. The commission may have technical questions uh, before we close the public hearing. And we'll try to ask all of those so we get clarity. Again, it's for this body to decide. The information has to come here. But the appellant will be afforded every opportunity uh, to present their case. All right, with that, then we shall proceed for the staff to make their presentation. So, Christina, if you would please. 
Can you hear me okay? Please. Okay. Again, Christina Burrow, planning staff. So before I get into the two appeals before your commission today, I'd like to discuss the background of where the site is located and what the applicant had proposed in a CEP application. The project site is located in the unincorporated area of the Santa Susana Knowles um, near Simi Valley. Um, it is about one, less than one mile from high, a State Route 118, um, and it is adjacent to Santa Susana Pass Road. The project site has two, part, two lots on it, um, and one lot is two, uh, just above two acres, and the other lot is 2.6 acres. The 2.6 acre lot is where the events were proposed to occur, and the two, the two acre lot is, uh, owned, is not owned by Miss um, uh, Vorenos. Um, it's owned by uh, Kevin Schatz, and he had agreed to allow um, the, the additional parking for the, the events on the site. Um, the project site is, has a, a land use designation of open space, and the zoning for the site is open space 160 acres as, as the minimum lot size. The surrounding property is, is predominantly open space zoning, and there is one, a small portion that is rural exclusive, one acre just south of, south of the project site. The nearest single family residence is about 491 feet west of the event area. And the city of Simi Valley and Coringville, Coringville Park and open space is north of the project site, and also the Southern Pacific Railroad. And residential areas are, are um, southwest and east of the project site. And um, a look at the area, a larger look at the area, there's about nine residences in the immediate area south of the project site. The project description. The appellant, um, as I'll refer to him today, um, and Ms. Vodinus is submitted an application for a CEP conditional use permit to allow festivals, temporary uh, festivals, animal shows, and similar events that are temporary and outdoor, uh, such as weddings and retreats on the subject property. 60 events per calendar year, which is uh, the maximum required under or maximum allowed under the non coastal zoning ordinance, and a maximum of 250 guests. There would be additional on-site parking on the adjacent property, which I previously mentioned was owned by um, another party. And the events would have occurred between mon from Monday to Sunday, 8 a.m. to 11 p.m., with the actual events occurring um, 1 p.m. to 10 p.m. There would be amplified music, and that would cease at 10 p.m. To orientate yourself with the site, uh, here's the site plan that was proposed. The brown area is the access and the parking um, that is mainly on the uh, adjacent property. And this is the, in yellow or gold, is the um, outdoor event area. Access to the site. So here's uh, some pictures of access. This is, both pictures are, are of Rocky Road um, that transect or uh, bisect the parcel. And the picture on the left is the entrance to the site, which is Rocky Road, and that looks towards the San Susana Pass Road. And a picture on the right is the entrance to the site, again, um, and it's actually looking the other direction towards Simi Valley and Highway 118. So this is just a, some pictures of the parking area. The picture on the left is a portion of the parking area and that is uh, on the adjacent property not owned by the applicant or appellant. And then this is the, the vendor parking area. Sticking a little bit. Okay. And these are some pictures of the temporary outdoor event area. The picture on the left is where the um, event and ceremony area uh, would be located and then the main dwelling um, is in the background of the picture. And this is just uh, the opposite view, and this is uh, the ceremony area, an event area for the, uh, for the uh, temporary events. Um, and then these are just some pictures, that, again, that are included in the event area. The applicant proposed to have um, a bridal changing room 
uh, underneath uh, the sunroom, and this was um, actually an agricultural barn that was converted into converted into habitable space with only a sink and a toilet permitted under a zoning clearance in 2013. Um, and the sunroom, um, as part of our site visit on, on May 8th, the uh, appellant acknowledged that the sunroom would be, would be used if inclement weather was um, an issue. But, and then staff advised him at that point that the room could not be used um, because, it is, because the events are temporary outdoor events. And then this is a picture of the portable restroom, uh, one of the portable restrooms underneath an oak tree canopy with exterior lighting. So the CEP application history is quite lengthy, so um, bear with me when I'm describing what's the, uh, the history of the application. So the application was submitted on November 7th of 2013, and on, a, on November 12th of that year, the appellant requested suspension of the application um, in part to update the site plan uh, to include the adjacent parking. And the appellants um, submitted that information on January 22nd of 2014. The first incompleteness letter was uh, issued on February 21st of 2014. And there was a clarification letter um, of that first incompleteness determination on February 25th, and that just had to do with um, a clarification as to inter internet advertisements on, uh, on the internet, um, and that they did not have to be removed because the county does not um, have, have a say in what goes on on the internet. Um, but it may be used to corroborate any events that would occur on a site, if there was a permit or not. Um, between May and August of 2014, the appellant submitted some of the revised um, application materials that were noted in the first letter. And at this point, um, staff informed the appellant that all of the items that, uh, all the items were not submitted and the 30 days would start when all of the incompleteness items noted in the determination, incompleteness determination letter were submitted. And actually this is the second time that that uh, notice was given to the appellant and because the first determination letter on February 21st included a paragraph saying that same thing. On August 1st of 2014, the application was suspended for the applicant's appellant's uh, failure to pay a CEP balance. And from um, October 1st to October 14th, the CEP application was suspended uh, for that same purpose. On October 31st, um, the second determination of an incomplete application was uh, issued to the appellant. And on December 16th, planning staff provided the appellant with a detailed list of items that remained incomplete based off the two incompleteness determinations. And again, on April 7th of this year and April 9th of this year, staff informed the appellant that by May 1st, um, if not all, if the, all of the remaining CEP application items were not submitted, the application would be terminated. And this is allowed per the zoning ordinance because the application was um, idle for a, a six month period or more than a six month period. So on April 30th of this year um, and May 11th, the applicant did submit um, some materials to um, keep the application alive. And also that, that included um, to a project description on May, May 11th. Um, May 8th, um, staff conducted a second site visit and we the pictures that I previously showed you were from that portion of them for that site visit. And on May 28th, the application was deemed incomplete for a third time and terminated. So uh, we have Senior Code Compliance Officer Elizabeth Cameron here and she's gonna be talking about the violations. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Cameron. I'm Senior Code Compliance Officer with RMA um, Land Use and Building Violations. Oops, going the wrong direction. Sorry. Um, this property has a, a history of having violations. Um, Complaints received and violations investigated that date back to 2011. A notice of violation was issued in 2011 
and subsequently um, complied with under a com uh, compliance agreement. Um, 2013, another notice of violation was issued, um, once again, for having internet um, advertisements of weddings and um, on the advertisements would have available dates for booking of weddings along with the um, short-term rentals. Um, 2014, I could not confirm events going on and I did not have a complainant's information to confirm the events. Once again, in 2015, received complaints from uh, citizens that events were going on every weekend and I um, requested the assistance of the Ventura County Sheriff's Department that if they did respond to a noise complaint, a disturbance complaint, that they would prepare an incident report to give to me so that I could um, prepare a case. Um, I accompanied uh, planning staff out on their site inspection. We do that quite often. Um, I have a um, assigned county car, so we went out there. Uh, Mr. Piplow knows me from way back in um, 2009 when our first violation case um, was active. And I came back and did research and did a subsequent um, notice of violation dated um, May 20th, talking about the events and the tree violation and some issues that relate to the um, uh, building violations. The picture on the left is the converted ag barn, which is under the permitted glass sunroom, which is used for yoga and other events. The document to the right was a, a documentation of an unpermitted wedding event that was um, obse observed by the case planner um, in 2014. The picture on the left is the event storage, which shows a number of tree, um, sorry, a number of chairs and events that were being stored for large events. And the picture to the right is the non-permitted outdoor spa, which is used in association with their short-term rentals. And then during our May 2015 inspection, this is the habitable space um, inside the converted ag barn. Different permits had shown that this space was either an ag barn, four car covered parking. And during our inspection, you can see remnants of drywall on the floor, um, the door into the two permitted um, bathroom. But if you look closely, you can see a sink and a refrigerator and some furniture and some equipment. The photograph to the right depicts a kitchen table, um, the ladder for the, per the closet being constructed, a bed, there was um, a refrigerator, non-permitted sink, items that would consist of a kitchen, such as plate, um, plates, silverware, coffee maker, pots and pans. So this did not, um, appeared to me in my professional opinion to be an ag storage area, but more of a um, use for human habitation and or changing. The photograph to the left is the valet parking sign that was tossed to the side of one of the structures. And the picture to the right is the amplified um, sound that they require to be used during any events. The photograph to the left is the portable restroom that was parked under the oak tree canopy that was men's and females. Um, and as we were leaving on May 8th, um, Mr. Piplo was taking, um, receiving some more portable toilets for an event that was gonna happen the next day. And um, Christina's gonna talk to you about the various appeals going on here, thank you. So before, before you today, there's two appeals uh, for you to decide upon. Um, they are both, uh, the appellant is the same. It's um, Piplo Vodnos for Tuscan Villa Estates. The first appeal is the appeal of the termination of the CEP application by the planning director's directive. And the county notified the, uh, the appellants of that uh, decision on May 28th of this year. And the appellants submitted a timely appeal on June 8th of this year. The second appeal case before you is uh, an appeal of the code compliance notice of violation, specifically the violation associated with having temporary outdoor events on the site without a permit, a CEP to do so. Uh, county notified the planning, county notified the appellant of that decision on May 20th, and the, the appellants uh, submitted a timely appeal on June 2nd. So the appellant has submitted some appeal grounds for both, for both appeals, uh, and they are um, 
described and rebutted in our, your staff report before you today. But I'm just briefly going to bring up some of the points um, that planning staff has to invalidate the um, appellant's claims. So appeal issue number two, number one for the termination of the CEP application is that the code enforcement violations should be disregarded entirely from, planning from the planning director's decision to terminate the CEP application. Um, the non-coastal zoning ordinance uh, requires, requires that where a violation is discovered on a lot where an application request has been accepted, said application shall be null and void and returned to the applicant. Well, this was the case um, because it was corroborated through internet advertisements um, and two notices of violation and also um, incident reports from the Sheriff's Department that events uh, such as weddings and retreats did occur on the site without a CEP. Um, so we terminated the staff, terminated the application. Did I skip one? Okay. Um, the second appeal issue uh, that the appellants have alleged is that planning division staff should reinstate all CEP applications, should reinstate the CEP application as the appellant has and continues to act in good faith and has made man many numerous reasonable efforts to complete the processing. Um, staff contends that this is not a valid argument or appeal ground because the application has been incomplete since November 7th, 2013. Um, and in your staff report, there is uh, sections of the, both the first two determination letters with all of the incompleteness items that uh, were still re remaining incomplete um, at the time the application was terminated. And as, it, as mentioned, there's three determinations of an incomplete application. Um, the appellant requested a two-month suspension of the application uh, from November 7th to, of 2013 to January 22nd of 2014 to get us a revised site plan um, to, uh, for the parking on the adjacent lot. There is also six months of inactivity between the first and second determinations of application incompleteness and between the second and third determinations of application incompleteness. And all the appellant did submit some stuff. Um, the appellant did not submit all of the required items. And also, the CEP application was suspended for the appellant's, appellant's failure to pay a CEP, CEP balance of about $7,047.11. So that the CEP application was suspended from August 1st, 2014, and reinstated on October 14th of 2014. Uh, continuing with this appeal ground, staff contends that uh, we provided um, written guidance uh, and identified required incompleteness items on, on several occasions, including December 16th, 2014, April 7th of this year, April 9th of 2015, and also August 1st of 2014. And again, no effort by the, uh, by the appellant was made to submit all of the required incompleteness items. So turning to the second appeal, which is the appeal of the code compliance notice of violation, the appellant contends that uh, he has been or they have been a licensed family vacation short-term rental facility for many years, operating under the names Family Destination Vacations and Tuscan Villa Estates, LLC. The appellant is legally engaged in providing short-term rentals to vacationers and families seeking to hold family gatherings, which can exist in the forums of parties. Um, the fact that the, the property is a rental is irrelevant to the issue of whether events were on site. Um, the events are for profit, and so, and their wedding events mainly that we uh, the staff has corroborated as has occurring. So that is a direct definition of what um, is a festival animal show and similar events temporary outdoor because you have the word weddings in there. And such events shall be limited to 60 days and they, uh, per year and require a conditional use permit. Uh, the appellant is, uh, the second appeal issue is that the appellant contends that the county has been informed for four years that events have occurred on site. Uh, staff contends that this, uh, this appeal ground is not valid because we informed the applicant on several occasions to cease conducting the temporary outdoor events um, until a CEP has been issued um, by the county. 
uh, as, as you will see in your staff report and through testimony here today, there's been 11 temporary outdoor events confirmed on the site after the application was submitted. Um, and also the sheriff's deputy did uh, confirm that there was a disturbance um, on the 28th of June. Um, and then we, as mentioned previously, there's two notices of violation confirming that the temporary outdoor events did occur on the site without a CEP. Continuing, um, oh, I do want to mention that um, the, the second appeal issue by the appellant for this appeal ground is a summation of the appellant's lengthy um, appeal ground. So it's just uh, some of the most important points that the appellant has um, provided in the appeal is what, we're dis what I'm discussing now. So appeal issue number two, um, the appellant at the request of the county in 2012 removed any and all advertising referencing the property as a wedding venue or a wedding destination. Since the initial submission of the CEP application, the county has repeatedly delayed and requested extensions, placing additional undue financial hardship on, on the appellant. Staff contends this is not a valid um, appeal ground because the county did inform the appellant that if the events were discovered on site without a CEP application, they may become null and void and enforcement action will be taken. And there have been several instances um, noted in your staff report that this did occur. Um, the county does not <laughs> regulate um, advertisements, business reviews, et cetera, on the internet, but we have, however, the county can use this information to corroborate um, whether an event occurred. And I believe it's exhibit 11 of your staff report. Um, is the code violation from 2013, although it was alleged only an alleged violation, it did include um, evidence of certain events occurring on the site um, and from the internet. And also, um, two extensions during the CEP application processing were requested by the appellant, uh, one in the beginning um, of the CEP application in 2013, and one when um, they needed to pay the CEP balance. And um, there were no extensions requested by the county. So the applicant also contends that the county continues to falsely accuse the appellant of placing and maintaining advertising uh, regarding weddings at the subject property. It has offered no evidence of actual ads, internet, otherwise, that were directly placed um, on and maintained by the appellant. And the appellant has never engaged or requested in any form its guests to make a, such um, entries on, on the site. And the appellant has um, also maintained a hands-off approach regarding actual rental activity on the property. Staff contends this is not a valid point because the county does not regulate, um, as I mentioned before, that um, what goes on the internet, but we can cooperate uh, with that information if a violation has occurred. Uh, staff, uh, the appellant contends that the county apparently asked the, Mo the Moore Park Sheriff's Department to engage in a systematic documentation and harassment of guests on the subject property. Um, in the absence of any evidence that the appellant is, is engaged in the willful continuing of the operation of, wedding, of a wedding business, uh, the, the alleged notice of violation should be abated immediately. So staff contends that the appellant continue to conduct unpermitted events on the site, as uh, previously noted. And the Ventura County Sheriff's Department incident reports resulted from citizen calls regarding loud music emanating from the project site by a, by a disc jockey. And finally, the last appeal ground for um, the code compliance uh, appeal of the violation is that while the, while the appeal is pending, the appellant finally, re, finally requests that there be a stay of any fines, penalties, or cease and desist orders as set forth in the county's May, 25th, May 20th, 2015 NOV. The appellant has made and continues to make a good faith attempt to comply with all of the various and ever-changing requirements that the county has imposed as part of the labyrinth of CEP application process. Um, so the appellant filed a timely appeal of the code compliance violation on the 2nd of June. And so civil administrative penalties, which the code compliance division can impose on, on a, a violation, were not imposed in this instance. Environmental review for this project. It is a project uh, pursuant to CEQA section 15,000. 
but um, the decision of on whether the, to approve the CEP application is not before you today. Um, if the Planning Commission grants the appeal regarding the CEP application, then um, it is subject to environment, environmental review um, when the CEP begins processing again. And if the Planning Commission, your commission decides the appeal, d d decides to deny the appeal, no, inventor, no, in, no environmental review will be um, required since there is no physical, indirect, or direct impact to the environment. Um, for this hearing today, uh, property owners within 300 feet of the project site and 16 parcels nearest to the site were noticed. There was a legal ad in the Ventura County Star and the Planning Division website. Um, their uh, Property Owners Association was notified and uh, Mr. Cummins did uh, speak to that issue with an email that we received last night from Marie Mason of the Santa Susana Knowles Homeowner Association. The City, Valley, City of Simi Valley was notified. They did not provide any comments and we did uh, notify interested parties, um, some of, of whom are here today. So before you today, you have some decisions. Um, should you, should the, the two decisions that you need to decide upon today are should the county continue processing the CUP application and did the county err in determining that a violation occurred on the property? So with these two decision options, your commission can either approve, deny, or approve with modifications to the appeal request. So again, to um, reiterate what the appellant's request is, the appellant requests that your commission grant their appeal of the planning director's decision to terminate the CEP application for, to allow festivals, temporary outdoor events on the subject property, and to also grant an appeal of the code compliance um, case number CB15-190 with regards to holding temporary outdoor events on the project site without a CEP. Okay, so uh, planning staff in the county recommend that you um, recommend it, uh, follow the recommended actions in the staff report before you today and deny these appeals. Um, so I, if you have any questions, I'm available as well as uh, from the people from the citizens from the community as well. Thank you, Christine. <clears throat> before we do that, I'm going to have to ask for disclosures from the commissioners. Commissioner Kelly? No disclosures. Commissioner Dukas? I have no disclosures. Commissioner Rodriguez. Um, I'm familiar with the area uh, over a prolonged period of time. Thank you. Commissioner Elsot. I have no disclosures. My only disclosure is the same as uh, Commissioner Rodriguez. I'm familiar with the area, but I have not made a recent visit in the last six months of the area. All right, with disclosure. Before we go any further, uh, I do have a question of our attorney, is that we have noticed two different um, actions on our agenda. One, the appeal of the t termination of the CUP process and then the violation. Uh, it looks like we have blended the two here. So procedurally, um, we have noticed two different actions on the agenda. So um, I'm sure if we ask the appellant, if it's okay to blend them together, but if you have any opinion on that. Or would you like to reserve that while we go through the rest of this? I believe they're, they're, they would require two separate votes right. because um, they're not necessarily um, linked. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll, I'll check that over and get back to you, but that's, that's yeah. my thought. You know, the only reason I ask that is because in the recommended actions, they have put both of them there on item six. So we have item seven noticed as far as the agenda. Uh, we'll clear up that technicality as we go, go forward. So, all right, any questions of staff at this point, Commissioner Dukas? One of the um, appeal grounds is that there were ever-changing requirements and that's why they could not meet um, this uh, completion. Uh, did the requirements change? Um, okay. Chair Westner, Commissioner Dukas, um, in your staff report, page six, it does, um, include the all of the incompleteness items that were um, noticed in the two previous determination letters for incompleteness. 
These are all of the items that um, were still grossly incomplete. Um, so the the um, appeal, well, so the incompleteness items or the requirements did not change from the time of the first determination to the last determination. Um, the appellant did did submit a revised site plan. Um, we did go out on the site to corroborate um, from what was what was submitted on April 30th of this year to what the uh, site plan showed and the project description, and there was some clarification needed um, because it was inconsistent. Commissioner Chair, uh, Commissioner Idukas, no, the regulations have not changed uh, since the initial application was submitted. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Spitzer in the discussion about the continuance was, he brought up the fact that new items came up in the last incompleteness determination. That's actually fairly typical when we're reviewing applications because when an applicant submits information to us, it could reveal new information that was previously unknown and therefore we have to address it as a part of that um, submittal. But none of the regulations changed. Um, as you're aware, the discretionary permit application, which came about from our process improvement efforts, is very, very detailed. It requires applicants to go through that. We have a very extensive checklist of submittal requirements for site plans, as well as technical studies to support applications, as well as just basic questions in order to give us the information that's required such that we can evaluate the application and we'll provide you with the recommendation. While exploring that further, were there any circumstances that were extraordinary or atypical that uh, revealed new information that was needed um, that would support the contention that there were ever-changing requirements put on by the county? Once again, Commissioner Chair, Commissioner Idukas, no, it's, it was one of those things where because we were getting partial uh, submittals, we get a site plan which did not address all of the items that are required for us to evaluate a site plan. Um, they would submit a new site plan which would reveal new information which would present new questions um, that we would not have known to have asked because we didn't even know of the information as part of the previous submittal. So then as a part of the next and completeness determination, we would then itemize that and say, okay, based upon your most recent submittal, we need the following additional information. But once again, that was not a result of changes in regulations or requirements or requests for what we need in order to evaluate an application. It was based upon the fact that new information was revealed as a part of their submittal, which presented new questions and requirements for additional information to try to figure out what was the actual proposal um, that we needed to consider. So, And then also, I, I should state that the project description had changed over time. So when we changed the project description, that can result in a request for new information. Thank you. And the only other question I had is I've, I have in my notes that the first violation was from 2009, but our staff report says 2011. What was that about? Did someone misspeak? Or is that uh, something unrelated to this? Cook Compliance did have a case back in 2009 um, that related to building and safety violations, not events. So, so. nothing, nothing yes. to do with this. Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of staff at this time? The only one that I have is that you represented on page 30 of your presentation, item 6, two extensions during the CUP application process requested by the appellant. There were no extensions requested by the county in Mr. Spitzer's uh, document he presented to us, page 3, uh, paragraph A, the second paragraph that Ms. Deanna took over on March 18th, and she couldn't meet the 30-day deadline and requested an extension, which is presented as Exhibit A. So, um, while they're doing that, uh, just real quick, for those of you sitting in out there, if you're parked in the parking lot to my right, your left, which is, I believe, G, it's a three-hour parking, so if you got there 8 or 8.30, uh, you may have to move your car because they will tick it. Chair Westner, Planning yes. Commissioners, I have confirmed that the appeal of the notice of violation is, is a separate matter and, and needs to be voted on separately than the appeal of the termination of the CUP application. Thank you. We'll, we'll deal with that when we get to the vote. Staff? Yeah. Commissioner Chair, yeah, that, that is correct. There was one extension that uh, Planning Division staff did request as part of the review. Um, 
That is the only extension, though, that was that plan division staff requested. Uh, thank you, staff, for the clarity. Any further questions of staff at this time? Uh, I have a question. Uh, as it relates to calls for service, if we can have the deputy ship up here. Deputy, please state your name again for the record. Mark Cardell, C-A-R-G-N-E-L. Thank you. Uh, Mark, in looking at our reports, um, uh, page 243 of our staff report, um, it identifies a, uh, a, a re uh, response to, I guess, a request from, uh, from code enforcement on calls for service uh, at that particular address uh, in question. Um, and I noted uh, that the page begins um, with calls for service um, in to 2009, and the actual first cause related to a disturbance occurred on November 7th, 2009, and then again in October and other dates beyond that. Um, procedurally, can you, can you explain to the commission how the sheriff responds to those types of issues? If we respond to a noise disturbance call or a party call, uh, what we usually do is we'll contact who's in charge or the property owner and, and advise them that we got a complaint from somebody. We don't tell them who it was and that uh, they're in violation of the Ventura County Code uh, noise, noise violation or also possibly 415 of the penal code and we'll ask them if they can turn down the music or the noise. 415 mean disturbing the peace? Yes, sir. And we'll advise them that they need to turn down the music or the noise. And if we come back, you know, there's a possibility that they might get cited for one of those violations. So the fact that, that a sheriff's department response wouldn't necessarily automatically, automatically shut down the activity because of some violations, you're there to maintain the peace and quiet of the neighborhood and you're not there to enforce a code violation that you may or may not know about. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. The reason we were there was for the noise, noise disturbance. And calls for service typically come from a reporting party, be it public or other governmental agents? Yes. Um, there's five specific uh, incident reports that we have here. Um, in 2015, May, um, those reporting parties aren't listed here on the incident reports, obviously, but that information would be available, um, or unless you have it available now, it would be available in the dispatch logs. Is that correct? Yes, I do not have the information with me right now. Okay, sir. thank you. That's all I have. All right, any further questions, staff? Thank you very much. Uh, staff at this time. All right, um, then with that, we'll have the appellant speak, and then after the appellant speaks, I will open the public hearing. Mr. Spitzer? Thank you. Please uh, identify yourself, because we have an audience at home listening to us. Well, now the pressure's on. <laughs> uh, I think from uh, the presentation that was made by Ms. Boero, the commission can now understand why it was that we requested a continuance. I am going to be hard pressed to be able to respond to every single detail. As much, in as much as I attempted to do so in the written submission, it is going to be very difficult for us to rebut all of what Ms. Boero said. And frankly, I'm lousy at PowerPoint. So I need help in order to do that, typically from a teenager. Uh, and uh, I didn't have a teenager in tow in order to uh, help me prepare. So let me do the best I can to rebut this and then go back and restate some of the issues that are underlying the appeals here. And with the, with the commission's permission, I'm going to deal with the issues as they come up, I'm not going to technically deal with each 
um, uh, appeal until the end of my remarks when I will go through and talk <clears throat> more specifically about the, the individual uh, points. There is a discrepancy, uh, obviously, in the facts of this case. There is a long history uh, of ownership here and of apparently some uh, conflict <clears throat> between, <clears throat> uh, uh, between the uh, RMA uh, and my clients who have been attempting to push forward the uh, conditional use permit. Um, even after submitting three different site plans, there is a discrepancy uh, about where the nearest single family residence is. It was recited that it's 491 feet from the site. Our information is that it is significantly further uh, uh, from the site than that. One of the points that was made by Ms. Boero in her presentation had to do with the definition of festivals, animals, shows, etc. I would note for the Commission that there is no specific definition as to a minimum of what constitutes a party, an event, an animal show, a festival, and so on. There is a maximum. There is a maximum of 250, but there is no minimum. So now we have a situation, and I, and, and I need the, the members of the commission to put themselves in place of the hapless applicant who has a valid license for transient occupancy for a vacation rental and has been operating in that capacity for a number of years and is now faced with a, a determination by a county office that somehow or other the use of that facility for weddings, events, and so on is not going to be permitted. So we have a legal use, a presumptively legal use as a vacation rental, and a use that then spills over into some other kind of use. So back in 2009, when the issue, uh, uh, or 2011, excuse me, when the, the issue was first called to my client's attention, as indicated in the written submission that I gave to, uh, uh, to the Commission, my client sought cl uh, clarification and was told events, you, that is to say, you may not plan events. You have the right to rent out the property as a short-term rental, but you do not have the right to plan weddings and so on without a CUP. And the question then was what happens if a tenant, if a short-term renter tenant plans an event? And the response that was given was, you're not planning it. You're not conducting it. And based on that simple understanding, my client has proceeded up until May of 2015 when the notice of violation and, and the, the termination of the CUP were given uh, and the county uh, uh, began uh, threatening, uh, uh, I think you'll see that in uh, uh, Ms. Cameron's May 20 email, there was a threat of a criminal prosecution. The criminal case was actually filed a few months later on August 24th. But it was up until that point that my client operated with an understanding that was tacitly approved by county officials. There had not been any issues with it. My clients were punctilious about not taking any role in the planning of the events. The contract which is provided by the county in support of its claim that somehow or other my clients were complicit in planning events is simply does simply not say that. If you read the contract, it offers the location as a short-term rental. It doesn't talk about us planning a wedding, us planning an event. It doesn't say anything like that. What it says is you are renting out the property, you have to maintain the property, you have to clean up the property, it's, it's a standard short-term rental agreement, but it has nothing to do with event planning. My clients were punctilious about stepping back from that role, and they did so. And I might add that this issue of internet advertising 
M Ms. Boero said in her remarks that we are continuing to advertise on the, in uh, on the internet for wedding events. That is absolutely categorically a lie. Didn't happen. From 2012 on, my clients took all of the, of the internet advertising off. It took a while for the county to actually issue the uh, notice of abatement, and, I, and I, I set that out in my submission. But my clients have not advertised on the internet uh, uh, for any kind of wedding events. The, the property is advertised only as a short-term rental in compliance with the license that my clients hold. I want to note, uh, by the way, also, that the site plan which uh, Ms. Boero included in her uh, PowerPoint is not the site plan my clients submitted. Uh, it's, it's another uh, site plan. Um, so I think, uh, and it certainly is not the updated one that was submitted on uh, April 30th of 2015. Uh, in compliance with uh, 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 the uh, notice that was received from the staff. Now, Ms. Boero has also, uh, in her presentation and in the staff report, uh, and in the notice of violation, the May 28 uh, uh, notice of termination and the May 20 notice of violation, has also indicated that there is some problem with using a permanent structure for a temporary event, and has made specific reference to the glass enclosure. I challenge you, ladies and gentlemen, to find me a statute that says a permanent structure can't be used in connection with a temporary event. Doesn't exist. The staff made it up out of whole cloth. And this commission needs to see that the applicant has been in compliance, has been attempting to make a good faith effort all the way along to comply with the staff requirements. This is but one instance of the shifting ground that I was making reference to. Another instance came up when uh, Ms. Boero talked about the CEQA regulations. I, again, I challenged the staff to note anywhere in the February 21, 2004 letter, in the October 31, 2014 letter, in the December 16 clarification, uh, or in the May 28, 2015 letter, I challenged them to point out where there is any reference to environmental clearances that are required. They're not there. They're simply not there. This is exactly the kind of thing that my clients have been dealing with all the way along. They have been making a good faith effort. In the submission, ladies and gentlemen, in the submission that we made uh, this morning, I also noted to you the issue of a photometric study. This was an issue that was resolved early on and yet now it's rearing its ugly head again in May 2015 after a site visit and the staff concluding incorrectly, incorrectly, that any portion of permanent lighting had been installed on the property. As to um, uh, the timeline, um, I think that the written submission adequately addresses what we uh, contend with respect to the timeline. Um, we are uh, 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 with regard to the issue of uh, continuances sought by the uh, county, uh, we stand by the statements that were made. There were delays occasioned by changeovers in staff, and there were uh, uh, delays that were occasioned by the failure of county officials to respond. I, I noted in particular that at, at a particular time when uh, uh, in December of one year into January of the next, it took almost six weeks to get responses to certain kinds of requests for clarifications. I have with me John Peeplow, and I'm going to call him in just a moment, but he will attest to the fact that there was never a period of inactivity with regard to the property. The, the applicant has made constant calls, constant communications over the period of time that it has taken uh, in order to attempt to get clarification and completion of the, uh, 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 the, the alleged incomplete items. 
Now, I have to question um, the presentation of the notice of violations. Were I in a court of law, ladies and gentlemen, I would have objected to this as uh, 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 not only irrelevant but prejudicial to the applicant. I will note, since we are not in a court of law, I will note, however, that every one of the violations that had been indicated prior to 2015 was abated to the county's satisfaction. It is not uncommon, as, as the commission well knows, it is not uncommon to have violations associated with property use. It happens. Abatement happens. Compliance agreements happen. My clients performed adequately and completed all of the requirements that were necessary with regard to each one of those agreements. So dredging them up now is only done for one purpose only, and that is to prejudice the commission against the, 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 the applicant and to paint a picture of the applicant that is simply ineluctably irrelevant and prejudicial. I would ask the Planning Commission to focus only on the alleged violations that are listed in the May 20, 2015 Notice of Violation and the May 28 Letter of Termination, which frankly are the only items that ought to be before the Commission at this time. I will note and I will ask Mr. Peeplow to uh, verify this uh, uh, by his testimony, that no complaint at any time regarding noise has been received directly by the applicant from any of the surrounding neighbors or from the homeowners association. There simply have not been any communications of that kind. Now, I need to go back a step uh, just to talk for a moment about the, the conceptual framework that my clients were dealing with. And once again, place before the commission the situation as my clients understood it. You have a property that is being let out for short-term rentals legally in compliance with county regulations. Now, the question becomes if someone who is legally renting out the property, subjects that property to an illegal use or commits a crime on the property, is that my client's responsibility? And, and I'm, let's just think about a couple of, uh, 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 of, for instances, if it's a no smoking zone because there are fires in the area and someone smokes. Is that a violation that my client is liable for? I don't think so. If someone smokes marijuana without a medical permit um, on the property, is that a violation for which my client is liable? If someone commits a murder on the property, is that a violation for which my client should be held accountable? I think the, the commission sees the direction here of, of what we're talking about. My client rents out the property for a particular purpose. People want to use it for short-term uh, uh, rental. What they do with the property once they get it is up to them. Now, I don't see anybody here, not one short-term renter who put on an event has been cited by the county. Only my client, the property owner who had no hand in putting on those events, has been issued a notice of violation and has been given uh, uh, a termination of a conditional use permit. I su submit, ladies and gentlemen, that this is patently unfair and that the, the application should not be terminated and that the notice of violation should be withdrawn. All right, let me... Uh, 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 I have some additional remarks to make, but I'd like to call up uh, John Peeplo at this point uh, uh, to give a little bit of testimony. And w with the commission's permission, uh, I will ask, we'll, we'll do this in a question-answer format uh, uh, so that 
things get pointed and not not uh, a narrative fashion. Just to advise you, Mr. <clears throat> as you represent, this is not a court of law. However, we, it is a quasi-judicial proceeding. We give a lot of latitude to the appellant or applicant. Simply, they have the right to state their case. So just let us know what's going on back and forth. But again, you're being listened at home. Uh, so uh, when you change names, please identify the speaker. Okay, John. Um, my name is John Peeplo, and good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Mr. Peeplo, how long have you been uh, involved in pressing forward with the conditional use application? Approximately two years. Uh, and in, in the time that you have been involved with the property at 1248 uh, uh, Rocky Road, um, have you ever received any complaint from a neighbor or a homeowners association regarding noise or the conduct of events at the property? To be perfectly truthful, yes. There was one complaint um, from one neighbor about, uh, about a year ago. And um, we thought at that time that we had worked out um, his concerns. Um, when we were renting the property going forward, we put a lot of restrictions on, um, on the renters to make sure that he wasn't disturbed and he even had an opportunity um, to contact us and, and uh, ask us to make adjustments if they were violating the, the essence of our agreement. In a few instances, not many, but at least in one or two, um, you know, uh, we terminated rentals because we felt that they weren't adhering to the, to the, the spirit of the, of the agreement. Okay. Um. Now, after 2012, um, did you continue to conduct activities, events on the property? I, you know, it, this speaks to the, really the foundation of what our argument is, is that I, I've never conducted an, uh, an event on that property, and neither has Mrs. Vodennis. Um, there was never an intention or... Uh, a plan to set out and create a wedding business or anything like that. Um, there was a time when, when people were renting the property and they were throwing family gatherings and, uh, and things of that nature. And, you know, I'll be the first to admit that as time went on and maybe it was word of mouth primarily that, um, you know, people maybe began to recognize that that site in that, in that way. But we were fervent about our interpretation of what the law was and that we were told repeatedly by staff and, and uh, rightly so that we could not be involved in the advertising, marketing, or uh, production of, of weddings or, or outside events like that of any kind. Mm -hmm. I frequently pressed for more um, information regarding that since the wording of that ordinance was so vague specifically <coughs> when, it, when it related to the, the word parties and, and I'd asked uh, Senior Code uh, Enforcement Officer Liz Cameron to give us a definition. I never could do. I, I never really got that definition, and it really has uh, strangled us economically because we don't know what to do with the property now because the county won't give us that definition. But but having said that, we felt all along that we were, we were, and the county was aware of this that we were working within the confines of what that ordinance was and that the staff was aware of it and it wasn't only until the inspection which took place on, on May 8th that this whole thing got turned upside down. Now after the May 8th inspection, I understand that there were a number of corrective items uh, with regard to Department of Building and Safety that were issued. There was some question about uh, uh, the glass house and there was a question about a spa uh, that needed to be removed. Um, was there a point at which you attempted to address all of those issues? Well, the first thing that we did, we appealed the violations primarily because the building and safety violations we didn't agree with. Um, for the most part, we didn't believe those violations existed. We felt that the accusations of there being unpermitted construction and so on was false. Um, Nonetheless, we, we immediately uh, went out to try to get permits. We were denied because there was a red flag put on the account. It took me several months before I was able to get building and safety in the Eastern District to somehow work it out administratively to uh, issue the permits that I needed to abate the violations. Um, now, wait. I, let's, let's 
make sure that we're clear about the time frame here. You said it took several months. When did that red flag go on that you were attempting to make these corrections? It, it went on immediately. As soon as the, um, we got the notice of violations at the end of May, um, we were even restricted from having uh, the ability to have film permits issued, and I had to come back and, and fight for that as well, because I argued that we had a stay, there was an appeal, and eventually I was granted uh, uh, the issuance of film permits so that we had at least some kind of business going on there. All right, and after, uh, uh, as of today, have you been able to address every single one of the building issues that were noted in the notice of violation? Interestingly enough, the only violations I've been able to address are the ones that, that come under the jurisdiction of the, of the Building and Safety Eastern Division. I'm, I'm still I, trying, struggling to even determine how to abate some of these violations. I, I'm 60 years old. I've been doing this since I was literally a teenager. I have a lot of experience with this. I don't think I've ever experienced anything like this in, in my life. But right now, the, the Building and Safety issues um, I believe we're not really violations. Um, I kind of took the high road and decided in lieu of the appeal, which as you probably know, we've continued. Instead of going to a building and safety appeal hearing, I've decided to just try to pull the permits to abate the violations. Well, let me, let me bring you back then to the specific violations that were outlined in the notice of violation. Um, there is uh, uh, the first item talks about uh, turning the changing room uh, into a habitable space because there was a kitchen there. Is there a kitchen there? No, it was a set prop. I mean, we use that for storage. Uh, Mrs. Vodenis owns a number of apartment buildings. Um, it's just patently false that there was a that was there was a bathroom in that room, or that there was a kitchen or an operating kitchen of any kind. Um, you saw the pictures. I mean, if the, I mean, those pictures were were taken clandestinely. I thought I was having a CUP meeting. I didn't realize I was being investigated. So um, the answer is no. Okay, and. At any point, have you been given to understand that uh, uh, the reason why the county has taken the position that the glass sunroom cannot be used uh, for temporary events? No, I've not. And this has been one of the continuing problems with the process for us is that um, depending on which planner I had, they recommended using different parts of the property to use as that changing room. We didn't care. It doesn't matter to us what building that, that the county wanted to designate to allow us to use as a changing room. The most recent one was the glass building. Um, just because it was an application uh, item, I don't know that it, it, it rises to the level of, of a violation since it was never used for that purpose. I'm not sure my question was clear. Ms. Cameron made uh, a point in, in uh, um, I'm sorry, Ms. Boero made a point uh, in, in her presentation that the glass building could not be used in inclement weather. Have you ever gotten clarification as to why the glass building cannot be used as part of a temporary event? No, it has air conditioning and heat, and it, and it was uh, issued a certificate of occupancy by the county, by building and safety. Okay. Um, as to the issue of the portable restrooms, um, were, w number one, um, uh, was the portable restroom parked underneath an oak tree? Yes. Okay. And was the portable restroom moved from under the oak tree under the supervision of an arborist? Yes. Did the arborist issue the report that we have attached and presented to the commission this morning? Yes. And did the arborist find that there had been any violation of Ventura County regulations regarding alteration of the oak tree, trimming of the oak tree, or uh, 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 interference with its drip line? None. Was there concrete poured under the oak tree? No, there was not. What was the material that was used under the uh, uh, oak tree to support the uh, portable potty? It was an aggregate of soil and uh, granite. Okay. Uh, finally, um, uh, when you calculated the acreage of the CUP area for submission in the site plan, did you include both of the parcels that were subject to uh, the CUP? Yes, at the, at the um, after probably the third letter of incompleteness, because it, we, at times, depending on what the flow of the process was, we, at 
first thought we had to put all of our parking on, on our primary property and not on our leased property. And then it became apparent later that we could use the other property, and that's why we expanded uh, the project description. Okay. And it, uh, along the lines of what we were talking about of new requirements, at any point prior to May 20th, 2015, were you asked to segregate on the site plan guest parking versus vendor parking? This speaks to the issue of what plan was placed before the, uh, the commission today. I submitted a revised plan that contained all of the, the items of incompleteness that included, for example, things as trivial as Mrs. Dennis's name being on the plan, but they were, they were submitted. I submitted them directly to, to Ms. Barrio um, on April 30th. Um, she looked at all the items that I submitted to her. Unfortunately, the plan that I gave her was not the plan that ultimately was distributed to staff. Now, there was an allegation made in the staff report that there had been periods of inactivity as long as six months where the applicant had done absolutely nothing to push the, the project forward. Is that accurate? That's not accurate, no. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about the efforts that you made briefly in order to push the project forward from the time that you received the first incompleteness letter on February, fe February 2014? The, one of the obstacles of this process for us was the, the changeover in planners. Um, we went through four of them. Um, I could get into a lot of detail about the various delays, and I believe that there were four delays that were created by the county. Um, so it wasn't just one, and these are documented because of the fact that we had new planners coming in. I remember there was one in, in 2013, for example, when the previous planner was pregnant and was leaving, and Ms. Barrio took it on, and then I asked, immediately sent her emails asking questions. I didn't get a response. I finally did, and she said, I'll deal with it after the holiday, and then that was January 22nd. So by the, by the time this thing was rolling, a month would go by, two months would go by before I would get an answer. The biggest frustration that I experienced in this process was that the, 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 the terms kept changing. You know, the, the items that, and we, we were inspected many times by the other planners. Ms. Ms. Barrio didn't even see the property until she was into it for five months. So if, if anybody should have been anxious, at least in my opinion, to see this project move forward, it really should have been her. But she said, understandably, look, I'm busy. I'm just catching up to this project. But that was the first time I'd seen it, really, was on, on April 30th of 2015. And then when they did that inspection a week later on, I believe it was May 8th. I, I think that uh, concludes the questioning. Thank you. Okay. Does John have anything else to say? or? Pardon me? Does he have anything else to say? Do you have anything else to say? I think he has a lot to say, but I'm trying to save the commission uh, some time here. Well, again, I understand you do have the right of rebuttal at the very end. All right. I, I, I feel like I've, I've, um, yeah, I've just responded to two or three core elements of this thing, but the whole process has been permeated with this kind of dysfunction for me. And um, it's been very frustrating, and, and there's been a lot of... Uh, duplicity and having to, uh, even for example, with some of the building and safety issues now, we're cited for violations for things that were cured years ago. So on the one hand, I have code enforcement stating that, well, you're in violation, and then on the other hand, I have building and safety saying, no, we permitted those buildings, and you're allowed to have those fixtures in there, and that, that spa was probably inspected eight or ten times. And it was on the last inspection was when Ms. Cameron was there, she decided that that spa was illegal. And so ultimately, we just tore it down because we just couldn't take it really anymore. And there's just this, this frustration of different inspectors, you know, applying different ordinances and interpretations of those ordinances. Let, let me just ask one final question. Have, have you or Ms. Bodenos made any conscious effort to try and circumvent the laws and ordinances governing the use of the property. No, we never circle. We never. Uh, everything was very transparent. I was always out in the open. I've had major staff meetings. There was one in February of 2014 where Kim Prillart was there and, and Liz Cameron and, and uh, the whatever planner was existing then at that time, Jim Dulperdang was there. And I stated our position and nobody refuted that. I said very plainly, we're not in the process of running these weddings. My interpretation of this is as follows, that we can rent it and if somebody wants to have a, a bat mitzvah or anything like that, as long as they're not 
they're not um, violating any other ordinances like sound and traffic and so on. We, we don't have any legal ability to, to with, withhold them from doing that if they so choose. It's a very, very fine legal line here for us. We don't know what that, what that line is. And even today, like I said, I've sent numerous uh, you know, emails to uh, Ms. Cameron, and I've never gotten a response. What's a party? Does that mean three people, five people? If I bring a barbecue outside, if I'm there? Th these questions really need to be answered ultimately by the county so that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. Frankly, at the end of the day, I feel like I was put into a, 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 a mouse maze from which I realized toward the end that there's really probably never going to be a, an exit for it, that we're just going to keep going around. Each time I get a planner, I'm going to get a new set of, of, of criteria, and then finally they pull the plug. Okay. Oh, no, hang on. Yes. i got to ask if any other commissioners have a question of you, John. Okay. Any questions of John at this time? Commissioner Rodriguez? Yes, uh, thanks for uh, testifying. Uh, were you ever made aware of any cease and desist orders by county planning on activities at the, at the site we're talking here? I was aware of, of notices of violation but not cease and desist. There's a difference in my in the uh, way they, uh, yeah. they proceed. Not, not to play semantics here. Did you specifically t to stop it? That was act activity yes, related. Yes, the, the, the answer commissioner is yes. Okay. Um, did you ever, on the premises, were you ever contacted by deputies? Once. And for what purpose? Uh, I'm not really sure because I wasn't there. Um, I received a phone call from a deputy who wanted to know what the, what the, um, uh, what the status was of our permit application. That was the only time during the course of these alleged violations that I was contacted. I wasn't there. I didn't participate. I never had even met any of the people that rented the property. I wasn't involved in the rental in any way, shape, or form. For the record, uh, on the staff report uh, 254 through 260, the sheriff's reports, um, that date was May 16th, where you were contacted by a deputy related to the activities in question, i.e. a wedding. It, I don't remember the exact date, Commissioner That's Rodriguez, fine. I, but it's no, possible. I, under, yes, I understand it's possible. that. Yes. And who was Tim Kirkhoff? Tim is a, a handyman who works part-time on the property for Mrs. Vodanis. Is he a caretaker? No. Does he reside at the, res at the property? Sorry? Does he reside there? No, he does not. He was contacted twice by sheriff's deputies in May as a responsible party on the site as related to wedding venues occurring as re in response to disturbance calls. Were you aware of that? Yes, I read that report because of the documents that the county supplied. Okay. There were the reports uh, the sheriff submitted to, to uh, planning uh, are sp five specific reports uh, related to incidents at that location all in the month of May. Mm -hmm. 2015, which, as I sit here, would be after um, representation, presentation had been made to uh, yourself and, and uh, et cetera, um, that those types of activities should not be going on. But they still went on beyond the June dates we've been talking about previously. Well, I'd like to point out that when we received the May 28th notice um, of a violation, um, we literally canceled every rental that was on the box. So um, that was that was basically what happened during that that period. That we uh, at that at that point just canceled all all rentals. So you're saying nothing occurred there after the end of May. As far as I know, no, because like I said, I was never involved in the rental aspect of this business. I'm an expediter. I had nothing to do. I, I'd never met any rental or renters. I didn't sign agreements. Um, I, I don't know who those people were or what they did. I, I, um, I did not supervise uh, Tim, the handyman. Uh, you know, I, I read in the report that he stated he was the property manager. I would probably refute that comment as well. I mean, I think he was overreaching a little bit about his authority. Because he was not an employee of ours and did not 
Uh, like I said, he worked he worked part time as a handyman. That was what he did. He's not an employee of yours. Well, I, as I said, he's not a well. He's not a full time employee. Excuse are, me. Are we playing semantics again? No, sir. Okay. I don't mean to. Okay. Uh, the sheriff's deputy that testified previously indicated that the information he has on calls for service at that location, I believe the last date of a disturbance call at that location was in June. I'm, I'm not exactly June 28th, maybe. The point is it was in June. Um, you're saying nothing occurred, no rentals occurred. I, I'm saying I was not personally aware of anything that, that occurred during that time. Who handles the actual rental documentation? Um, there's a woman in, uh, in Colorado who actually works off the internet. She How about signatures? How do you obtain signatures? Sorry? How do you obtain signatures? Uh, from renters? Um, again, you're asking me questions that are outside of, of the scope of the work that I did. So, so you, I, I don't you're, know. You're I, saying, I didn't see them. Okay. So you're saying you never had any personal contact with anybody that rented the facility? Not in the last few years. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. John. Thank you. Daniel. Just a uh, couple of remarks um, uh, to finish up. Um, I, I will note in, in response to uh, Commissioner Rodriguez's uh, pointing out the police reports that actually start a little bit earlier than what you noted. I have them as Exhibit 13, and uh, <clears throat> they start at page 247. The, the narrative that is attached to each one of those uh, reports indicates calls either to Ms. Vodenos or, or to John Peplo, and if you look at what um, Ms. Vodenos and, and John uh, uh, Peplo said, they recited precisely the same legal position which has been taken here. Um, I'm just going to read an example, uh, uh, page 249, um, uh, crime incident report from, um, well, it's the first one, so I'm not sure where the date is. Um, looks like uh, May 2nd, May 2nd, but I'm reading from page 249, and it says, quote, I called Vodinos, and she told me the following in summary. Vodinos told me she owns the property on Rocky Road. Vodinos told me the property is her vacation home, and she rents the property when she isn't using it. Vodinos told me she feels she isn't responsible what the tenants do when the property is being leased. And I think that that is consistently the information that has been given to my clients by the county and that my clients have acted upon. So to change the rules in May of 2015 and say, wait a second, not only can you not perform these events, but these events can't happen at all. That's, that's a sea change. That's a big change from what had been told to my clients all the way along. Now, in, in compliance with the May 28 termination letter, my clients, you, you heard it from Mr. Peeplo himself, they just canceled all the events. They didn't want to be in dereliction of their responsibilities to the county. And so I, I will simply point to that as additional evidence of the good faith that my clients have operated with, with respect to pushing forward the CUP and also trying to live within the, the letter of the ordinances that are promulgated by uh, Ventura County. My final point, the notice of violation, and I want to start there rather than, sorry, rather than with the, uh, 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 the March, uh, the May 28 letter. The notice of violation provides specifically that there is time until June 22, 2015 to abate all the violations that are stated in the, uh, uh, in the notice of violation. I submit to you that my clients did that. They made a diligent effort to address any of the building issues and they immediately stopped the weddings and any events and any rentals of, of the property on a short-term basis, other than I believe there was a film rental, and I suspect 
that the film rental may have been the issue uh, that that uh, the, dep the, the deputy was called out for on June 28. Uh, but I don't have the crime report, so I can't see exactly what the uh, call was in response to. Um, but other than, than the film rental, which was done legally through the county, through the office uh, uh, that handles uh, film permits, there was all, all rental activity ceased as of that time. The notice of termination was issued on May 28. Now, if my clients were supposed to have been given until June 22, to abate the issues that had been addressed in the notice of violation. The county should not have terminated the CUP. And you heard from Mr. Peeplow, the county red flagged the, uh, 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 the permit process so that my clients couldn't even obtain the permits they needed in order to abate the violations. Y you can't do that. You can't put an applicant in a vice and then on May 28, say, well, look, you haven't abated any of these violations, and so we're going to terminate your CUP. That's just dirty pool. That's not the way things are to be done here. My clients are anxious to proceed with this project. They are anxious to get the job done. They are anxious to bring this sad episode to a conclusion so that they can move on and turn this property into a profitable venture for them and for the county. They are bringing business into the county. Their sole purpose in all of this is to run a law-abiding business where they and the county can benefit. I ask you to deny the notice, uh, uh, that, that is sustain the appeal with regard to the notice of violation and order that the, uh, uh, the March, uh, May 28, 2015 letter of termination be rescinded. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else for the appellant at this time, or uh, Daniel? We do have a question. Give me a chance to your microphone, please. I'm trying, trying very hard to understand your legal argument that a short-term rental somehow avoids the responsibility of complying with the, the appropriate ordinance and requiring CUPs. You say that if you have no management and control over the renter you have no responsibility for a activity or event that is in, would be in violation of CUP. Is the short-term renter then violating the CUP? Is anyone violating a CUP when events take place on a regular basis that would be held in violation of CUP if your client organized them? My client didn't organize them. That's not them. what I asked you. Is anybody responsible? Is anybody responsible? We have, we have a zoning ordinance. You have neighbors. You have other people. These things come before us all the time. And I'm being asked to recognize that this short-term rental is somehow an exception, which would allow people similarly situated to do the same thing. And, so I'm trying to get my arms around and, this. And, and I appreciate uh, uh, the question. Um, the, the direct answer to your question is the folks who conduct the activity are the ones who are at fault. In other words, the short-term renters who put on events in violation of the county code, if in fact they are violating the county code, um, they are the ones who should be held liable. Let, let me give you an well, example. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. No. So you're saying that a property owner who does this short-term rental situation, knowing that we are going to have events that would otherwise violate the code, have no responsibility whatsoever, I find that really hard to accept, sir. Uh, this, I, I, it I, makes I, no sense to me, if you want to know the truth. Well, who is to be responsible? L let me give you an example, which I think may help to clarify the point. Um, I, I, I represent a fair number of property owners in my practice. One of my clients leased a unit uh, to an individual who, as it turned out, was going to be running a medical marijuana clinic. Now, my client leased the property. Uh, it was a completely valid real estate lease. There was nothing wrong with the lease. But it turned out that the medical marijuana uh, facility um, was within 500 feet of a schoolyard. 
Um, and so the, uh, 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 the, the operator of the facility was cited and had to close down. Now, is my client liable when my client says, you check out the zoning, you do whatever you want, I'm, I'm simply renting you a space. What you do with it, you have to figure out whether it complies with the zoning laws and with everything else that goes along with it. So in that situation, I think it's real clear. My client, the landowner, is not responsible for the activities of a tenant. So I, would I, you have a situation where there's a complaint and Liz Cameron is called out and she sees a, an activity that's clearly illegal, shut the place down? If, if it's illegal, yes. Well, I find it really hard to understand and believe that you have a business which knowingly conducts illegal activities on site and yet bear no responsibility for it. Well, and... and <clears throat> Knowing that this is a business, a recurring business. And I understand, I understand the dilemma uh, or, or the analytical uh, difficulty that, that you may have with it. But my, my clients ran this understanding by the county. It, it, they didn't make it up. Um, Mr. Uh, uh, Peeplo, uh, and if I need to, I'll get him back up here. He had a meeting with Mr. Wright, uh, of the RMA and said, okay, we're not permitted to do this. Is anybody else? What happens if a short-term renter uh, uh, puts on a wedding or an event or something like that? And they read the ordinance, and the ordinance specifically says the, that you, the applicant, cannot conduct festivals, animal shows, and so on. And so the words that were, were told to my client were, you don't do weddings. You don't do events. Whatever the, the tenants do is up to them. Now, I, I'm with you. I think that if, if there is a rule, it should be consistently applied. And now, after May 28, when the county made its position clear after operating under a different understanding for several years, my clients immediately took steps to abate that issue by canceling all further reservations. They just want an opportunity to proceed with the CUP. There's nothing, there's nothing per se that is damaging to the public health and safety by the operation of a wedding. I mean, we're not talking about toxic waste spewing out into a, uh, a stream bed. Um, we're not talking about a meth lab uh, Sir, being operated have, on You the have neighbors who have legitimate expectations that zoning ordinances will be met. Understood, and I agree and, uh, with that. we are going to get into what the tacit agreement was, believe me, okay? Well, that, that's going to come up in a few minutes. So I understand your position. I just can't share. I, I just don't see it, sir. I think he bears an ultimate responsibility for the activities of an ongoing business that repeatedly conducts weddings that are a clear violation of the condition, or of no conditional use permit, the zoning ordinance. Now, if there was a tacit understanding from the county, okay, I want to know about it. And I well, think, gentlemen, I think, I think we've <coughs> made Mr. our record. Mr. Spitzer, uh, as okay. Of now. I think we're in that debate, so, uh, but we do have public hearing testimony. You'll be allowed to follow up. Thank and you. And that's the debate we will have with staff. So, Sorry, uh, and that, no, hey, no. You're bringing up the valid point that I'm sitting questioning, but we're not there yet. So, uh, thank you. Uh, is there anything else from the applicant at this time? Not at this time. Thank okay, you. Th thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a uh, quarter after 11. I know I'm of a certain age that I need certain breaks at certain times. Um, again, I remind anybody, if you're parked over here, 1130, you might want to move here. We will take another recess until 11. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're back on the record. Uh, thank you for the recess. I appreciate that. We just completed with the appellant, and uh, we are now going to go to open the public hearing to hear uh, people. Remember, those who are in support of the appeal uh, get to speak first. I do not have anybody that supports the appeal. So is there anybody that would like to speak on behalf of that? 23 years, and I still don't have my Jeopardy music. Oh, we got big boxes up. 
All right, then what we'll do is, and I'll read uh, those that are oppose uh, the appeal. And the first person is, my apologies, Colin Wainwright, followed by Irene Wainwright. When you come up, please state your name for the record. in contention. Um, I am definitely opposed to even the issuing of a conditional use permit because the, these last few weeks anyways have brought back to me the reason why I bought property out there and raised a family and planted trees because of the peace and quiet and the solitude of the country life. And that has been decimated by the noise from our neighbors on once, twice, sometimes three times a week. And it's been going on now since uh, you know, I, first, I first started looking into how to get this resolved back in June of 2012 when I went to um, Congress, Councilman Floyd's office and talked to somebody named Chad and he referred me to code compliance and it's just been going on and on and on. But in this whole issue, in this whole thing, um, I'm a re retired high school teacher and I've heard a lot of stories and been snowed many times and it's getting pretty deep. So I, I'll admit to speaking with um, John and Arna twice, meeting with them, you know, because they were concerned about my noise complaints and John gave me his cell phone number and he said, look, call me, text me. Let me know when it is too much, I'll take care of it. So I've got text me message records that I'll make available to anybody that wants to see them that shows he must have been on the premises during these events because he did shut them down. He did quiet them down <coughs> after repeated text messages back and forth. Also with meetings that I've had with them, I was offered vacations to Hawaii, dinners that whatever restaurant of my choice uh, as some sort of compensation, I presume, but of which I denied everything. Um, all I gotta say is that these activities, somebody does have to be responsible for them. And it's the homeowners in the area, and I, I represent actually five other homeowners that couldn't make it, are concerned because of the traffic <laughs> the loud screaming and yelling of drunken patrons that come out of that place and the noise that just goes on way past 10 o'clock up until you know two three o'clock in the morning sometimes if i don't get up and start complaining or do something about it um, as far as what happened <coughs> in june of or may of 2015 from the neighbors i've got records of the sheriff being called all the way up until May 30th and on. And I've got names of, of the, you know, the sheriff people that they spoke with at the sheriff's department. So this is not just a happenstance thing that stopped on a certain date. It kept going. Any questions of Colin at this time? Thank you, sir. We appreciate your time and your patience for All waiting. Right. Irene, and then the last speaker card I have is Bob Wood. Uh, your name again, Irene. I'm Irene Wainwright, Thank you. and um, I was the one who made the call on June 28th, and I'll tell you why the call stopped after that time, it was because I just got fed up. I just, um, it was always, having to call the sheriff's office. And in fact, the last time I called the sheriff's office, they said, well, how do you know they haven't got the permit yet? And, you know, I felt like I was being the bad one when in actual fact, th there seemed to be nowhere to turn. We were, uh, you know, it was a loss. There was nothing that could help us. So I thought, to heck with this, I'm, I'm just gonna close all the windows Still, the thumping would come through my pillow, even if I closed all the windows, and it's bad to do that on a hot night. Um, uh, you know, it was 
it, this disturbance is more than a disturbance, it's really an abuse of you know, our lifestyle. So I would like to respectfully ask for some, you know, something to happen. We don't, we don't want this in our neighborhood. Questions of Irene? Thank you for coming forward. Uh, Mr. Wood, and that's the last speaker card that I have. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Bob Wood. I've uh, been a realtor and a resident in the area since uh, 1979. I knew um, the builder of the uh, home, Mr. Uh, I go blank. <laughs> uh, I knew him. I knew the Mr. Uh, um, I'm losing my names. It was, um, doesn't matter, I guess. I'm sorry. Uh, at any rate, I've known this property for 20 years. It's a beautiful, beautiful home. And um, I can sympathize with the current owners going through the bureaucratic uh, morass of the building department. I can also state that I've been treated very fairly by these people, firm but fair. And uh, I personally would have no complaints about the department. Again, I acquiesce to the fact that, yeah, it, it, it is a morass and there are uh, lots of businesses. Um, I would like to, to bring up the fact, though, that uh, we are open space. Uh, Ventura County at the beset of the state of California uh, prior to 1980 had to set aside a certain portion of the county for open space as part of uh, state regulations. One of the, um, I think some of you may be old enough to remember Gunsmoke. The old Gunsmoke uh, site was up off of Box Canyon Mount Studio Road. When the zoning came in, they were eventually um, zoned out because they did not conform. Um, I see a bigger picture uh, than, and the, I, again, I, the Wainwrights, uh, are upset, they're distressed, but I see a bigger picture. We have a very unique community. We have homes that date uh, nearly 100 years ago that are less than 1,000 square feet. Uh, in view of this home, you can see a house up on the ridge that's over 10,000 square feet on the market for $8 million on 126 acres. So we have a lot of divergency. But the thing that, that um, holds us together is this rural feel. And, you know, I appreciate Learned Council's dancing. I mean, he should be on uh, Dancing with the Stars. The fact of the matter is, if it walks like a duck and looks like a duck, it's a duck. And whoever is running it, whoever is not running it, um, we have a commercial uh, enterprise going on there. You know, I, th I think uh, there was a um, governor that said he put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. And, I thank you for your time. No, hold on, Bob. Oh. Anybody have a question for Bob? Thank you for coming, sir. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. All right, that's the last public speaker card I have. Is there anybody else of the public that would like to talk? Hearing none, then it's been requested of the chair that we call one individual. Would you like that, Commissioner Rodriguez? Yeah, if we can uh, have the sheriff's deputy back to the podium, please. Good morning again. Good morning. Deputy Mark Cardell. Thank you, Mark. Um, when you were up here previously, I, I asked you about calls for service, and you indicated that the last call for service was June 28th, I believe, um, be between the end of May and, and in the month of June. Were there any other calls for service in June at that address? Yes, there was, sir. There was one on uh, June 20th, approximately 2,100 hours for a party disturbance call. There was also one on June 27th at 2123 hours, which a report was taken, an answer report was taken at that time by the deputies. And finally, the 28th, which I mentioned earlier. Is, was that also a disturbance call? Yes, disturbance call. And when you say 2145, that's military time. That means 945 PM? Yes. Uh, was there any reports taken, or were they just responses by deputies to resolve the issue? The 20th and 28th were just responses, and the DPs were advised 
to keep the to keep okay. the noise down, which they complied because we weren't called back out there. Okay. But on the twenty seventh, the uh, incident report was taken. There was. Yes. Uh, do you have a copy of that report with you? I do not have it with me okay. right now. Okay. Okay. All right. That's all I have. You other questions of the deputy this time? Thank you very much, deputy. Thank you. Appreciate your time today. Yeah. <clears throat> Can we excuse the deputy? Uh, we can certainly try. I know that. Is there any other questions by the commissioners of the deputy so we may excuse him? Okay, no, I'll, I'll get that. Does the applicant, or appellant, see any need to re keep the deputy present? No, I, I would simply uh, object to the introduction of uh, any evidence uh, uh, that has to do with calls that were made. We don't know who made the call. We don't know what it was about. We don't even know if it was for this property address. Um, and the deputy wasn't there. Um, he's he's taking this off of computerized records, so I, I think this is just irrelevant. Well, thank you. It's noted in the record. Uh, anything from staff to re retain the deputy services? All right. So let it be st stipulated that all the parties are will allow the deputy to get back and do what he does well. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, any other people that the commissioners would like to question at this point in time? All right. Then Daniel. Your rebuttal, and then we'll have final words from staff, and then we'll decide whether to close the public hearing. Thank you. <clears throat> I honestly don't have a great deal to add, which I'm sure that'll make you happy because we'll all be out of here by lunchtime, right? Um, I do have a few words, and I hope that, um, notwithstanding the comment about a duck, um, uh, I hope that. The council can, uh, uh, the commission that is, can see that <clears throat> what is what is being argued for here is the ability to move forward with a project that has uh, um, been ongoing uh, as a vacation rental that my clients have worked long and hard to progress uh, uh, with respect to and should be given an opportunity uh, to do so. With regard to the issue of, of the public comment, those of us who deal with land use issues and with uh, zone changes and such, there are always issues that come up in terms of one neighbor or another not liking an imposition or a change uh, in the existing use of a particular type of property. Let me, let me address that by saying to you that I think if the commission thinks about, thinks about it fairly, that granting <clears throat> the appeal and permitting the CUP to go forward even with a compliance agreement, which we would welcome, so that there would be a, a timetable and, and certain conditions, uh, objective conditions that could be met. Oh, we're perfectly happy to do that. But if that goes forward, think about what will then be in place. You have, <clears throat> you have at the present time, or at least up until May, when my uh, clients stopped uh, leasing out uh, 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 the, the location, you had a situation where there was a tacit understanding that my clients wouldn't be involved in the operation of, of weddings. They wouldn't conduct them themselves. They wouldn't advertise. They pulled all their advertising. They stepped back uh, from taking any frontal role in that. They simply engaged in a short-term rental uh, uh, process. And it was then the short-term renters who put on the event, who did whatever they were going to do with the property. And I, I, I need you to understand that you've heard only about weddings and large events. There have been innumerable smaller events. The property has been leased out, rented out on a short-term basis for many, many, many small gatherings, families, and otherwise. So. What I'm, what I'm asking you to do is to envision now a situation where the CUP is in place, and now, now you have a situation where the Wainwrights come forward, and the Wainwrights say, wait a minute, you know what? There's too much noise. 
Well, the Wainwrights now have an address to go to because there's a CUP holder and the CUP holder has control over the property. And at that point, if my clients are given the ability to do what Mr. Wood said we were doing, which is conducting a commercial enterprise, yeah, it's a, at the present time, it's a short-term rental. But if my clients are given the opportunity to do what they want to do, which is to run that commercial enterprise themselves, then you have an address to go to. You have a person who is the responsible person who, if you don't like what they're doing, you can yank the CUP. But they have a right to move forward with the conditional use permit. They have a right to attempt to use the property in a wholly legal manner. And all they need is some cooperation from the various county agencies that have to provide oversight and a sign off by the commission. That's, that's really all that is required at this place because the open space ordinance certainly don't uh, prohibit the use that my clients are contemplating uh, and, and that the CUP contemplates. So all things considered, from a policy standpoint, where we all should be pulling, our, our argument is predicated upon the end game. That what the county really wants to see is a systematic um, <clears throat> treatment of the conditions of the CUP, making sure that the CUP conditions are met and maintained, and that there is not a a, uh, a, a, a chaotic uh, understanding or any kind of tacit understanding where someone can operate on a short-term rental and this and that. You don't want that. What you want is for there to be a CUP holder who has the responsibility for operating the business. Now, from a formal standpoint, let me just go back to the issues and tick them off for you. And I'd like to start with the notice of violation because it segues into <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the May 28 letter. I apologize for my voice. Um, the notice of violation and <clears throat> the specific items have been addressed in the written submission. Every one of those items has been taken care of. Every one of the non-transient items. And what I mean by that is the building code violations, uh, uh, purported violations, because in certain cases there were no violations at all. Uh, and all of the other issues that were raised in that notice of violation have already been addressed. As to the violation, the alleged violation that had to do with conduct of weddings, we've stated our, our uh, position. Um, but this is a transient violation. Once the wedding or the event or whatever it is that's causing the problem is done, it's done. It's not a continuing violation. It's something that has been abated because it's stopped. So there really is no further notice of violation to address. And since the applicant has made it clear that there won't be any further events that are taking place on the property at this point until the issuance of a, of a CUP, that part of it doesn't even require abatement. It's just done. So from, from the standpoint of addressing the issues that were contained in the notice of violation, the appeal should be granted. The notice of violation, of course, is the predicate on which the May, ter uh, uh, the May 28, 2015 termination letter was sent. And if the notice of violation can't stand, then the notice of termination should also be rescinded. Now, <clears throat> in her initial presentation, Ms. Borio talked about the fact that the commission has a decision to make. That decision, with regard to both appeals now, that decision is to deny the appeal, um, grant the appeal, or grant the appeal with conditions. I would like to suggest to the commission 
that in the interest of moving forward, the applicant is perfectly willing to have the, uh, 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 a compliance agreement entered into. My clients have made it amply clear that they intend to proceed with the project regardless. They're, they're, they're going to go forward with the project. If it means, that re I keep doing that, sorry. If it means, uh, uh, if it means resubmitting a CUP, they'll do it. They, this is a project they've committed themselves to. And so one way or another, it's going to move forward. We would like to move forward with the blessing of the commission, with established timelines, with established commission, uh, 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 conditions, and get the job done. The proceeding that we're involved with, and I, and I am sensitive to the fact that the members of the commission are, are people who have other careers and, and, and uh, uh, give liberally of their time, but the procedure that we are involved in here, the, the challenge to the CUP, the, the appellate process, and, and all of that, ultimately from an economic standpoint, is a huge waste of everyone's time and resources. What really should happen here is that we start pushing in the same direction uh, and move this uh, project along. If the commission has any questions, I'm, I'm all ears. Otherwise, I will take my seat. OK, any questions? Commissioner Ronsop. In your previous testimony, we, you spoke of a tacit understanding that your client had with planning staff regarding the temporary use and the permissibility of it. Who at county did you, did you or your client communicate with so I can ask appropriate questions? In the uh, <clears throat> letter that I submitted this morning to the council, uh, on page seven of my letter, I wrote as follows. In an early meeting near the commencement of this project, Mr. Peeplow had conferred with Winston Wright requesting clarification as to whether the applicant would be in compliance with the non-coastal zoning ordinance if the facility were rented to parties who might then put on their own events, family unions, uh, reunions, or even weddings. Mr. Wright reviewed the ordinance and concluded with Mr. Peeplow that there would be no violation so long as the applicant herself did not conduct the event. Um, my letter then goes on to recite that uh, there was a meeting that took place in March of 2014 between John Peeplow and members of the RMA staff, including Liz Cameron, Jim, I apologize if I butchered the names, Jim Delperdang, Kim Prillhart, Melinda Talent, Daniel Kleeman, Go slower, and please. Andrea Osdy. Could you back up to Kim, please, and come forward again slowly? I got Winston Wright, Liz Cameron, Kim Prillhart. Uh, Liz Cameron, Jim Delperdang, oh, okay. Kim Prillhart, Melinda Talent, Daniel Kleeman, Daniel Kleeman, and Andrea Osdy. Yeah. And it was during that meeting that Mr. Peeplow made it real clear this is what we're doing, and nobody took uh, 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 umbrage at it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other questions of Daniel at this time? Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Staff, who leads off? <laughs> Thank you, Chair Wessner. Um, I'm going to lead off and, 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 and set the framework for the big picture items that I heard today and use the code to kind of uh, back into to where I think we should be. Um, Winston, right, is clearly here with us. This is Dan and, and Liz, and, and they can be... Uh, uh, here for any questions or give presentations on their rebuttal as well. It's, it's at, your, um, at your pleasure. But I'm going to talk about the responsibility of the property owner, the inside versus outdoor events. You know, what, what is a party in the interpretation of the code and the ability to interpret the code? Um, the meeting that I had with Mr. Piplow um, and a compliance agreement. So I'm going to try to hit on all of those relatively quickly. So the responsibility of a, of a property owner, they're ultimately responsible in the code um, for the property that they have. Um, it's incumbent upon them to know what is going on on their property. If we have a conditional use permit, which we don't right now, it, um, 
it reverts back to the zoning ordinance, and the zoning ordinance says that the property owners and his successors in interest are the responsible party for compliance. If we have a CUP entitlement holder, we go after them first, but if we don't get any success with them, even all of the CUPs now, the property owner is the ultimate responsible party. That, that's a standard. I don't believe there's any um, miscommunication about that. It, there, it definitely isn't any miscommunication with my staff about that. That is just a um, ABCs of planning and land use. That's the way that works. The inside and outside, you know, why can't we move into this glass building during inclement weather? I think that would be the same argument for any of the farmers out there who have these great barns. They're like, why can't we have the wedding in the barn? Well, because you can't have three people in a, 300 people in a barn because the barn is not meant for 300 people. The barn is meant for hay, right? So there's different occupancy standards that you would have to have. Um, so not only that argument, but the very definition of the permit that they're applying for um, under section 8102, the applicable definitions. So here's the way it starts out. Outdoor recreational events. It's not indoor. So all of the temporary 60 days or less outdoor events, that's what they're called, that's the two reasons you can have them. You can have them temporary, and you can have them outdoor, and you can have them with a discretionary permit. That's the way that works. There is some um, discussions with the wedding venue industry that they may want to come in and ask um, to apply for an ordinance to be able to have them indoors. That would come through your planning commission. That would come through the Board of Supervisors to see if that's an ordinance that they want to do. But right now, that is the law of the land. The, the question that I think that, that's, that's confusing, and I have some sympathy here, when his question that he asked, um, Mr. Piplow asked to Liz Cameron is, what is a party, right? What is a party? That's a, that question resides in a very simple definition, which is called accessory uses. The only thing that is out there right now is a single family home. That's your permit by right and you can have that permit by right, and everything else you do with that umbrella of a single family home is considered an accessory use to that, unless you get a conditional use permit to say otherwise. So right now you have a single family home. An accessory use is a use customarily incidental, appropriate, and subordinate to the principal use of the land or buildings located upon the same lot. Those are very simple words, but they're very powerful words. I have a home. Can I have my daughter's wedding here and can I have 300 people? Yes, of course you can, right? Can I rent out my home and have a wedding business? No, no you can't. You know, can I have three people over for a barbecue? Yes, can I have 300 people every Friday and Saturday through the summer? No, right? So there's things that you just have to take into consideration. Reasonable, customary, subordinate, those words are very important to any single family home. So you, if you rent out your home or you have a VRBO or whatever, that still has to encompass the primary use of single family residence. Whatever is going on there still has to meet those requirements. So just because you lease it out through an agreement doesn't give you the responsibility to just say, I'm, I'm out of that game altogether. Whoever is renting it still has to maintain that for the sake of the neighborhood, right? So that, that's, that's the, the, the definition to that. And then what happens is when you go back and, and you look at 80, section 8101-4.10, it says, because it's infeasible to compose legislative language which encompasses all conceivable land use situations, so we would be forever defining what is a party, how many can you have, you can have three, you're in this zone, not in this zone, you'd have to do a huge EIR to even analyze all of that. So it says because it's so, it's inconceivable to do that for every situation you come across that the ordinance is already large, you can imagine what it would be um, if we defined every single thing in there. The planning director shall have the power to interpret conceivable land use, uh, can interpret the regulations and standards contained in this ordinance when such interpretation is necess necessitated by a lack of specificity. So that's what I go to. I think that they're being treated the same as everybody else. We've had this conversation many times with many venues, with many individual property owners. We've written property owners letters that saying, no, you can't have large parties on, your, on, your ha on a house that you lease out. So I don't believe that they're being treated any differently. That's the way that the 
ordinance is interpreted. In, interpreted. My, uh, the, the incompleteness cycles, it's very hard um, to hear, so I understand that they, they did go through planners. People have children and, and get promoted into other jobs, so it's unusual to have that many series of planners, although I have looked at the case in a whole, and I, that, that is not what is causing the delay here. I very carefully went over everything to understand how do you get three incompleteness cycles. It's very rare. It's, it's, it's a less than 5% out of the hundreds of applications that we have going on here. We've worked so hard on that front end, making sure applications are complete because that's the way that they really get through the system very quickly, that we have, I believe, the last time I looked at it, 85% of the people that come in are, in are complete in their first cycle. And then very few in the second cycle, less than five in the third. So if you're in the third cycle, I asked to be involved, I want to take a look at it, I'm like, what in the world is going on that you would still be here two years later and don't even have a complete application for us to review, right? That, that is something that I'm putting eyes on and wondering why that is. We also have a section in the code that says, if your application remains incomplete for over 180 days, we can shut that application down because clearly you're not making a good faith progress. So although I heard from Mr. Spitzer and Mr. Piplow today that they, they felt that they were, I think this is such a rare occurrence and I sat down and had a conversation with Mr. Piplow myself to say, you know, this, this really needs to, to move forward. Had a long, honest conversation with him. Not only did it need to move forward, but you really need to get out there and, and, and have a conversation with your neighbors about this because I think as your, your commission uh, realizes, there's wedding venues are a very difficult permit to get. So even though they're discretionary and you can apply for it, and I can recommend, which I have in many instances, if you meet all of the sequent and you can make all of the findings, they still can be unpopular and come here and be denied. So they're expensive. He's already had a problem paying the bills. So we said, this could only get, you're not even complete yet, right? You haven't even gone to hearing. You haven't had your environmental review. This could get very expensive. You better go check with your neighbors just to see how everybody's feeling. So we did have that, that, that conversation. Tried to be very honest with him about the expense and the time that it could take, especially if they were already having a problem just getting a complete application. So. The, the, you know, the, the upshot of the story is I'm, I'm happy to process this permit, happy to enter into a compliance agreement, setting tight timelines on both our parts. We'll do this in this time and you'll do this in this time to get an application before a decision maker because I think that that's really what it needs to do. Um, so I'm happy to do that. The, 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 the way that we just said we have to shut it down is because we just can't let this 180 days go on. We have other work to do. It gets expensive for the applicant. It's costly for the staff time if you're not on top of a land use entitlement case. And so, you know, I just want to, I just want to put that out there too, that I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it under a compliance agreement with strict deadlines on, on both of our parts. So that's, that's kind of the big picture items I wanted to frame up for you. If you have any other questions for me, I'm happy to answer. Um, you could probably hear from Winston on, on his side of that, uh, that story, the conversation that he had with Mr. Piplow as well. And I see Liz brought a box down, which is scary. So, you know, if you have questions for... Uh, we'll get to Liz Mr. Baca her. later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> questions of staff at this point? Uh, I'm not sure who to direct this to, but I thought that uh, we had testimony from the appellant that May 28th, they just stopped renting out the property altogether. But we have calls for service June 20th, June 27th, and June 28th with an incident report on the 27th. Um, uh, who, was, who was making all the noise then? Anybody have any information of, I, since we let sure. the deputy go? I believe that I heard Mr. Spitzer or somebody say that there was a film permit that was issued, and I know that, that I also weighed in on that, which was one of the issues why I thought we really needed to move forward with an, with an appeal date, and, and we did get a confirmation of this date by saying, you know, all enforcement action is stayed, so they can come in and get other entitlements from the county. Um, so it could have been a, a film permit if a film permit was issued, or I'm not sure if somebody lives on the property now, but it... it so, the so the answer is we don't know. We're not sure. We're not sure. Okay. Um, 
The other thing is, thank you for clarifying uh, who you is when you talked about your um, your successors and interest where you may not conduct a wedding. It's it's you and it's it depends on your definition of you. So um, I think that was that was pretty clear. Um, Regarding the, the determination to terminate the um, application, um, is there, um, I recall reading that there was a, a guideline that uh, we terminate a conditional use permit application when there are violations on the property. Were these violations all abated? Notwithstanding the argument that because the party's over, there's nothing to, um, there's, there's no violation. Um, if I may speak to that, I know building permits have been obtained for the items that were noted in my notice of violation letter of May. They have not received a final inspection as of yet. Um, my office was um, contacted yesterday regarding the number five item regarding the arborist report, and um, we responded back that an arborist report was going to be required regarding the oak, oak trees and the location of the temporary um, toilet. I have not seen it. I don't know if it was submitted over to the planning um, counter yet, um, but that would be for the building permit issues that were observed um, with the notice of violation. Um, there was a compliance agreement that was requested from Mr. Delperdang and through various um, offices in the county up to Supervisor Foy's <coughs> office that code compliance entered into a compliance agreement to allow the remaining of the weddings that were booked for the summer to, to finish out, and we had to deny them on that because there's no conditional use permit that was ever permitted for that property. So if we need a compliance agreement, the building and safety issue should be taken care of soon. I don't see a delay in that. And, um, but a compliance agreement to allow um, activities um, to go on um, cannot be entertained at this time, at least from our department. So is, any other questions regarding permits? No, that's clear. Okay. Liz, excuse me, Liz. May I, may I, I have just one question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, just one question. Yes, sir. We've kind of cover the gamut on the issues as it relates to a viol notice of violations. All the activities that are occurring there aside, hypothetically, we're just isolating the building code violations. Those are issues that have to be dealt with and corrected regardless of whether there are activities there or not. Is yes, that correct? Sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Daniel, no, no, you'll have your opportunity. Okay. We're trying to find information out now, so and please have a seat. And I just would like to clarify. Um, Daniel, I would like for you to sit down for me. Thank you. Thank Liz, you, you were here to hear the discussion that uh, the applicant feels that there was a tacit understanding with some members of staff that their temporary use permit uh, somehow accepted them from a CUP. Did you ever give anyone that impression? No, that's why I referred to the earlier violation cases that were opened and subsequently um, closed because they took off different um, items from the internet, which would say like wedding available wedding dates or or talk about you know great facility for events and and things like that. Thank so you, ma'am. I did. I, I think I sent emails also. So, uh, my Jim Delpernang, director of code Thank compliance. You. Um, certain things are hard to prove, you know, unless you're there at the time. You don't know what people know and, and what, they, what they understand. I believe the property owner knows that weddings are taking place on the property. She knows at the time that she's, she's renting them. Um, we had someone contact our office that said that um, they read on Yelp that the county didn't have a permit for the activity on that property. He said she, he contacted Ms. Lodanos to get a refund of the $5,000 his daughter paid. She offered him $500, uh, offered to meet him, uh, let him use the property between now and the end of the year, 
uh, any weekend or any time it was available in return for the rest. Um, we read Yelp like everybody else. Um, I'll read one to you um, where somebody named Arna replies. Um, you know, they're well aware that wedding events are taking place on the property. Uh, well, well aware. Um, they can come up here and say, gosh, when I rent it, I don't know what happens. I'm a landlord, you know, to Kim Prillhart's point. Um, my tenant has an in-op in the driveway, puts a storage shed in a setback, doesn't get permits for what's required. I'm responsible. And um, that's the way we've treated this from the outset. Um, there's no tacit approval from my department for them to have non-permitted events. The date that Mr. Piplo showed up with his appeal, he asked me if he could enter into a compliance agreement with me so that he could have five more weddings. And I said, you're not hearing me. You don't have a permit to have weddings. No, I'm not going to enter into a compliance agreement with you for that. Um, they're well aware that weddings are taking place on this property. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't bring um, the father of the bride that tried to get a refund. Um, but. Um, I just want to respond to the idea that um, we gave tacit approval for this to occur, that they didn't know weddings were taking place. We have a picture, they knew we were coming, of a valet sign. Wedding materials on the ground. They didn't bother to pick them up, hide them, cover them up. Um, I, I don't even know how to respond to, uh, to um, all the evidence that's been presented. Uh, any event, um, that's my, my testimony. Any other questions of staff? Anything else from staff? Daniel, thank you for respecting the commission. I appreciate that, sir, very much. Thank you. Let me uh, uh, just respond um, to a couple of uh, uh, the statements that were made. Um, and, and somehow or other, either my remarks have been misunderstood or there is a failure to communicate effectively. Uh, Ms. Cameron said something about us requesting a compliance agreement for the conduct of additional, um, uh, additional events during the time period that the CUP is pending. I said nothing of the sort. The applicant is asking uh, at this point for two things. We want the appeals to be granted but we're willing to accept a compliance agreement that would set a timetable for conditions and so on uh, for, for benchmarks to uh, be addressed. And I think Ms. Prillhart's uh, uh, remarks were directed to that. We, we did not say, and I am not urging the commission uh, to issue any kind of a compliance agreement that would allow for uh, uh, the conduct of events um, uh, until a CUP is issued. So I, I, I want to get that squarely out in front of everybody uh, so that there's, there's no um, uh, miscommunication. Uh, in addition, Mr. D Del Perdang, did I get it right? Good, I'm, I'm progressing. Mr. Del Perdang's uh, uh, comment that um, uh, we were that, that somehow or other we're claiming ignorance of the fact that weddings were taking place. I, I'm not sure where that came from. We, we were aware that the short-term tenants were using the property for events. How could you not be? Um, but that wasn't the purpose for which the properties were leased out. The properties were leased out for short-term rental and the understanding express and tacit was that the short-term renters could do what they wanted with the property after they had rented it. That at that point, the ability to control their activities by, <clears throat> by the property owner lapsed. Now, you may not like that rationale, and I understand that you don't like that rationale, but that is in fact the rationale that my clients operated under until the end of May when they were told, you gotta stop everything, you gotta stop everything altogether. And, and that's what they did. Now, frankly, I don't know what the uh, calls were about uh, in June of 2015. Um, and my only suggestion, not knowledge, but suggestion was that we know there was 
a film permit issued, and it might have had something to do with that. But I would ask the commission to simply disregard uh, uh, these these uh, uh, issues that are brought up, because the 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 applicant is, has been very clear. All the rest of the rentals were canceled. Period. End of story. And after Mr. Uh, Delperdang uh, denied the the request to allow um, uh, the applicant to fulfill the contracts. Uh, that had already been accepted. I believe it was for five five more uh, uh, weekends. Um, after that was denied, those were canceled. Period. End of story. So the the applicant is not trying to do an end run around anybody. Uh, is there a question? You see the confusion on my face because you I do. just you just appeared to contradict yourself. Then, at, the then please. at the at the okay, for clarity's sake. I do believe that you said at the beginning of your um, addressing us that uh, you did not ask for uh, the continuance of the uh, uh, wedding activities, yet you just alluded to you did. Then, then let me be perfectly clear. Mr. Peeplo uh, approached Mr. Delperdang after the notice of violation and said, can we fulfill these five contracts, he said no, and they were canceled. I am not now asking the, the commission to... Okay, I'm clear now. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I, I don't want to belabor the point. Um, it, it seems to me that um, what we have here is uh, uh, a relatively clear, um, <laughs> hopefully relatively clear set of facts. The... Uh, uh, the, the applicant has been moving forward from our vantage point in an expeditious manner in order to prosecute the application, the CUP application. We want to continue. We want to make this into a workable project that will benefit everyone in the county and us. That's our goal. In order to get there, we need to have the commission either deny, uh, uh, excuse me, sustain the, the appeals so that we can move forward, um, or we need to have some conditions attached to it that we can reasonably live with. And we're perfectly happy and willing to move forward on that basis. And that's it. I appreciate the time of the commission. We thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> The chair is now going to hold on a second. Hold on a second. I appreciate you putting your hand up, though. Um, I got a procedural issue that I need to deal with right now. Okay. You have offered going into a compliance agreement. I have heard staff offer going into a compliance agreement. I know there's an October 7th date when parties are going to sit at a table. We have two matters before us to decide either approve or deny or modify. So um, giving the time frames and everybody trying to get to the right resolution without additional expense and time, uh, I'm trying to understand if you were willing to get into a compliance agreement and you talked about it and the, the other things I put, what are we looking at because we'll have to make a decision here. And if, I'd like to see us make the right decision for all the parties. Or we can continue the resolution. <laughs> so uh, procedurally, um, I'm going to look to county council a little bit because I know we, we have to deal with the decision on both issues. But also staff, if you can give me some us some help to forward uh, as far as our deliberation. Jeff, well, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what the okay. planning division says in terms of the compliance agreement, but. Sure. Right. Um, in terms of what's before you today, I don't see any reason why, and maybe this is a, I mean, sure. I want, again, why you couldn't take action on the application either way and then have a compliance agreement flow from that. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, just I, guess, I guess my thought is I don't see. It be terminated. Yeah, because it, like, is it a den uh, approval of the appeal, denial of the appeal? With you know, I, I'm just right. Well, there would have to be a, a new application. Submitted. New application. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. uh, staff on the way in? As far as the... 
from staff, my, my recommendation would be to, to weigh in on the NOV issue, because I think we heard a lot of testimony about that today. All right. And then the, the continued processing of the CUP, you can just direct us to enter into a compliance agreement in 30 days or so, and the compliance agreement would have to address the, you know, the abatement of any outstanding violations in a timely fashion, the processing of the permit on both of our sides, and it sets timelines. We do that routinely. Your application needs to be complete by this date. Um, and then any past due uh, bills, you know, in order to, to bring that up to speed. So that's, we would encompass that all in a compliance agreement. Pam. Or? Pam, so let me let them finish. Whoops. I get, I get both of you. Go ahead. So there is outstanding. Okay. Let them finish their deliberation. For the folks at home, we're scratching heads and looking at each other. Where do we? Yeah, I, I, what Dan was was raising. <laughs> it, it's okay. What Dan was raising is the issue of the appeal fee, right? And so he's he's paid to to appeal two separate decisions. And so if the, you know, if you if you grant or deny in part, right, then you need to struggle with what part of this hearing they should pay for and what's a part of the hearing that the county would pay for. So then we we're trying to figure out what, what those numbers would be because it's, you know, clearly a substantial amount in, uh, on the, the county's time and staff time to prepare for a hearing, an appeal hearing. So they've appropriately asked for the appeal hearing. We gave them the appeal hearing. There's a fee associated with that. And so, you know, that's something that I think, and maybe D Jeff can chime in there because he just did so, a little bit of work on that for the board um, about what, what decisions that you would have if the decision was to go and prepare a compliance agreement, what part of that fund to process the appeal would be, could, or would be, could be, should be, be wrestled with. And so maybe that's what you can discuss. County Council? Right, if your commission, um, in terms of the, uh, the uh, processing of the CUP application, if you direct staff to enter into a compliance agreement, then um, it's within your discretion to get, it, that could be considered, um, as, as Ms. Perlhart was alluding to, that could be considered a partial upholding of the appeal. And so then at that point, it would be a follow-up decision for your commission would be whether um, or not to refund um, any part of the appeal fees, that's completely up to you. So that would be a follow-on decision that you need to make. And so no, no guidelines have been saying 25%, 50%, 75% of the return of the fees? No, that's, in, in, yeah, it, it could be from, from zero to 99. Okay, thank you. All right. Commissioners, now that I've really muddied the waters. Okay. Commissioner Dukas. I'm going to be very honest with you. Um, um, I don't have a lot of faith and confidence in uh, in what your um, what Tuscan Villas um, has done and is willing to do and is doing and will do. Um, I have very little confidence, and the testimony I heard today uh, gave me uh, less confidence because of the, um, and I know it's because of what you do, but the overly legalistic way of uh, interpreting language, um, holding up your hands and saying, you know, we didn't, we're not responsible, we just operate a rental. Um, when it's, it's very clear, the whole uh, reason d'etre for being here is that you, um, your client was uh, uh, pursuing a CUP for these uh, for a wedding venue, which would, um, you know, something that, that we, we try to support. Um, I don't have um, any level of comfort at all that a compliance agreement at, at this point will make um, anything happen differently than it has in the past and up and, and through this proceeding. Um, 
I don't see uh, all of the all of the letters that we've gone through back and forth um, show an unwillingness and uh, a disregard uh, for the um, for the laws that we we have, the guidelines we have, uh, the zoning we have for the protection of neighborhoods, and the process we have for finding um, you know conditional conditions where you you can have uh, a wedding venue. So I am completely unconvinced, and I would find on the uh, hold on. on the, uh, we haven't closed the public hearing, so we need to hold off for a second. Here. Okay. Procedurally. Okay. Sorry. I hear what you're going. Uh, it sounds like we're getting into deliberations, uh, but I still have a person of the public that would like to speak, Ms. Wainwright. Uh, please come up, identify yourself. Daniel, you will have a chance to rebut. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I think your, your uh, non-confidence is very well founded. Um, I forgot to say that after June 28th, all through June, there were events. It was just that I had despaired, so I was not calling them into the, into the uh, deputy's office. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything further, Daniel? Or, or John? <clears throat> Remember, you're on the record. Um, yes, I, I just I would like to address the issue um, regarding the complaints. Of Hold on, John, just a second. Let's have an understanding here. We're trying to be equitable, but there's a procedure to follow. You have been heard. And when I asked that gentleman to sit down, he was kind enough to do it. Now, please respect the procedure. Ma'am, you're out of order. If I have to have you removed, I will. Thank you. John? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, if, if this will help the commission in reaching an understanding and an agreement and a decision regarding whether or not um, Mrs. Vodenis um, is willing and is able to um, to adhere to a, a compliance agreement, I, I think for the record you should all know that um, when I first began working with Mrs. Vodenis roughly six years ago on this project, initially I was brought in to clear up three quarters of a million dollars worth of fines and penalties and violations um, and liens that had been accrued against the property over the course of several years. Um, it took me two years to do it and during that time um, I was able to enter into a compliance agreement with um, Jim Delperdang and his staff, and I felt they were very fair and very reasonable, and I also believe that I complied with all of the, um, the terms of that compliance agreement with that much money at stake, um, and we were able to successfully conclude that compliance agreement. So there is a history here where we have shown that good faith, and, and we are really willing to um, to work very diligently now that we've we've had this discussion and and I feel like we understand better, um, um, for the lack of a better word, the legalese of, of 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 what we did and what our interpretation was from uh, from staff. I think that we we have the foundation now to be able to move forward without you having any kind of uh, issues or problems with us, even remotely coming close to. Um, uh, any of the past activities, rentals, um, and, you know, I would move very quickly. And, and like I said, uh, we've, we have this history with the compliance agreement in the past. Thank you, John. Thank you, sir. All right, at this point, I am going to close the public hearing, and it's time for us to deliberate. Uh, commissioners, I will refer back to you that we have two agenda items, six and seven, even though they are intertwined in the recommended actions. We'll have to act upon them individually. And if we necessary, county council will provide us the language. Uh, Commissioner Dukas has, has already given an opinion. I'll allow some more. Anybody else? Steve, uh, Commissioner Hansat. I concur with the commissioner that the agenda items are intertwined. I concur with Commissioner Dukas. In my mind, the cum cumulative evidence that was presented today at least in my mind, reflects a conscious failure or refusal on the part of the applicant to assume responsibility for compliance with a zoning ordinance and the use of his property. I could not support his logic. I think it's, it's quite far-fetched even to present that argument. I find that the planning director's termination of the application was entirely appropriate at this time and would make such a motion to follow staff recommendation. 
Okay, before we move on to a second, uh, like I said, we need to, to deal with the difference in the, the violation. Item six. Item that, six. That pertain to item six. Okay, and that would re remove number five on item six, which is the uh, temporary after violation. That would be the item removed. Am I correct, County Council? You no, know, I'm looking at. Um, I'm looking at the the recommended actions mm -hmm. from item six and seven. I, I believe they're the same. Correct. And so. The issue is, um, I think maybe it would be the best if um, if your commission could turn to the either item, turn to the recommended actions, which are on pages um, 31 and 32, mm -hmm. um, and then peel off recommended actions and, and, and vote on them separately. Okay. And so if it's your pleasure to vote on um, processing of the, the CUP application issue um, first, then... Um, that would be dealing with recommended actions two and three. Right. And then the, the separate ac action would be dealing with the notice of violation appeal, and those are recommended actions four and five. And so that would be appropriate for a second motion. And then there should be a, a follow-on housekeeping motion um, regarding recommended actions one and six which specify or certify that your commission has considered all evidence. That's number one. And then number six is, is specifying the clerk of the planning commission as a custodian of records. So I, I hope that's, that's clear <laughs> enough. And so I guess maybe going forward, if, if, if you want to deliberate and, and make a motion on the, um, at your pleasure, either the, the notice of violation or the, um, the processing of the application. And okay. Deal with that first. All right, <clears throat> I'm going to give the clerk time to get on confused down there. <laughs> She's panting already. Uh, before I ask for a second, is there any f further deliberations as far as the matters before us? You don't have to. Just because I look at you, you don't have to. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, just, just a brief comment. I, I, um, I concur with Commissioner Dukas and Commissioner Onstad's thoughts on this. Um, We've had enough testimony, I think, and there's enough evidence in the record, uh, including documents uh, uh, that represent a lease agreement uh, by the applicant with at least one rentee, rentor, um, uh, that specifically talks about what in venues dated uh, in May. Um, well, I hear uh, um, the applicant stating that uh, events in June were canceled once they were they knew there was no compliance uh, agreement in moving forward to allow those events to happen. Um, I find it hard to accept the comments about the fact that there were cancellations when in fact the sheriff's testimony indicates from their records that they responded on three different dates uh, to disturbance calls at that residence. Um, so I'm prepared to move forward on, on the issues, both issues that this at the appropriate uh, time to vote. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else? All right. The, um, I concur. Though I, <clears throat> I did accept Mr. Spitzer's analysis, and it does open a gray area at night. I don't know. I know the code is written a certain way, but when it said the maximum of 250, but there's no minimum, and it creates an, a gray area. I understand when it becomes a repetitive process, uh, that becomes uh, evidence of the situation um, and I'm, I looked at that and I'm, that's reasonable I mean if I have a birthday party for my grandmother and we have 20 people or like when we did have one for my grandmother it was 300 people um, God bless her so um, I, I can see where there's greater but it was to me it's the, it was the repetitive nature of the situation um, and I accepted the fact that we went through four planners and I, I brought that issue up as far as the extension. Um, but I have to concur with my uh, colleagues in the sense if we allow a little narrow crack to, to develop, I think the, the director properly brought it up, next thing you know we got 300 people in the barn and we have other issues to start to develop. Um, what I'd like to recommend, since we have a motion on the floor as far as denying the appeal, that it include the recommended actions one, two, I'm sorry, yeah, one, two, three, and six. Okay, rather than do three separate motions. 
All right. So if the maker of the motion for denying the appeal of the recommended actions be one, two, three, and six, would that be your motion? I would amend my motion, yes. All right. Do we have a second? I would second that. Okay, now we're going to. So are we up with the, the motion on that? And Rodriguez? Okay. All right. Any discussion on that particular motion? Hearing none, please vote. Did you vote? So I'm clear. A yes vote is to, to to recommend an action to deny. And to, yeah, just to be crystal clear, to because it's confusing, the the, the motion is to basically a, a approve staff's recommended actions one. One two three and six. One two three and six. So that's the motion. Oh, for item six. For item six, right? Wh which are the same as, as item seven? Yeah, but but that, that has to do with the violations. That's why I wanted to okay. make that clear. All right. Do we have the votes? All right, we have the votes. All right, moving on to item seven. Do I have a motion or discussion? This has to deal with the finding of the violations. Or would somebody like to make a motion of the recommended staff actions one, two, I mean one, four, five, and six. I will make that motion that we um, follow staff's recommended actions for Number one, four, five, and six. Thank you. Second the motion. I have a second. Any discussion on the motion? I'm trying to give the clerk time to get the machine going here. No further discussion. Please vote. Everybody vote? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, who seconded that motion? Peter. It was. Uh, it, it showed my name up there as opposed to. Uh, that's cool. That's right. I don't mind either. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, both have been denied uh, for the reasons given as cited. However, uh, I would highly recommend, since we appear to have a meeting on the seventh, that all parties be encouraged to enter into a serious compliance agreement as a result of that. Uh, but however, I will let. The process take take it from this part. All right, we will take a five minute break. We do have another matter to hear. Thank again. Thank you everybody for your patience and your input. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. We're back on the record at 10 of 1. Uh, we are in item number 8, PL15-0076, Crimson Pipeline, LP. And today, Mr. Jay Dombrowski. And the question is, Jay, how tall are you? 6'4". <clears throat> Closer to 6'6", six, six, I bet. Oh, is that right? Yeah, okay. All I know is you're the, one of the few people who can actually stand there and look at us right now. Eye to eye. This afternoon. The item is case number PL 150076, a request for a conditional use permit or a CUP for an existing petroleum transmission pipeline. The applicant is not in attendance today, but has submitted a letter agreeing to all of the terms of the proposed CUP. 
that's uh, Exhibit A that you just received this morning. The project is located between the city of Ventura and the city of Oxnard, along the coast within the right-of-way of Harbor Boulevard. The northern end of the pipeline is within the city of Ventura. The southern end of the pipeline is within the city of Oxnard. It's the middle portion of the pipeline that is within the county unincorporated area. The project is the continued use of an existing underground pipeline. The portion within the county is approximately 10,800 feet long, that's about two miles, and is directly under Harbor Boulevard. A portion of the pipeline crosses the Santa Clara River under the Harbor Boulevard Bridge. The pipeline is accessed from Harbor Boulevard. This is a view looking south from the bridge. This is a view from under the bridge. The pipeline comes out of the ground and is attached to the bottom of the bridge. The pipeline is not visible from on top of the bridge as it's underneath the roadway. In 1991, the Planning Commission granted CUP 4641 for the construction of the pipeline. The CUP was granted for 20 years and expired in 2011. In May of 2015, the applicant requested a CUP for the continued use of the pipeline. When the previous CUP was granted in 1991, the Planning Commission adopted a mitigated negative declaration. Potentially significant impacts were identified for the construction of the pipeline, and mitigation measures were attached in the form of conditions of approval. The proposed project is the continued use of the pipeline and does not involve any physical changes to the environment. Staff has not identified any significant impacts and has prepared an, an addendum to the mitigated negative declaration. In order to grant a conditional use permit, your commission must make certain findings pursuant to the Coastal Zoning Ordinance. Staff has detailed the project's consistency with those findings in the staff report and recommends that your commission make those findings. After the hearing documents were published, staff made a change to one of the recommended conditions of approval so that the time limit of the permit would coincide with the franchise agreement that the applicant has to operate within the county right of way. Pursuant to the Coastal Zoning Ordinance, the surrounding property owners and residents were notified of today's hearing, and an ad was printed in the Ventura County Star newspaper. Based on the previous discussion, staff recommends that your commission take the actions detailed in the staff report. That concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Any questions of Jay? Yeah. Commissioner Ronsot. How big is that pipe? How, what's the diameter of the pipe? I'm sorry. The hear. diameter of the pipe. The pipe is eight inches round. But the only the only real threat to this, I assume, would be the washout of the Santa Clara. Huh? Right. And I'm. The questions I have, I think, would normally be subject to review of the state fire marshal, who I assume ad nauseum has conditioned this thing. Is, am I not correct? Staff had conversation with Push your the button. It's lower than, than you think. Years. But this thing, it's it, under said, the it says push. Uh, thank, uh, thank this you, is a holdover uh, Mr. From Chair the last and hearing. Councilor Ronstadt. Uh, uh, this was a newfangled device. You guys are having your own device problems. Uh, anyway, uh, this pipeline is part of the Crimson Pipeline system that snakes all through the county. 
Uh, there are 400 miles of uh, wow. tra oil transmission lines in the county of Ventura. Uh, all of them are under the uh, jurisdiction of the state fire marshal, which has sort of uh, regular inspection uh, routines and, and running smart pigs, that is, uh, you know, corrosion detection devices through these pipelines. And so they, they're always under a constant set of maintenance. This pipeline is, uh, is different than some others in that uh, it's in entirely in county right-of-way, uh, meaning that the county can uh, make them hold their feet to the fire with a $20 million life insurance or you know, disaster insurance policy, which wouldn't necessarily occur except in a place where there's a county right-of-way. Uh, just going over the hills and through an oil field, there wouldn't be that kind of insurance. So this is different and better in, than in most cases. But uh, we don't have any jurisdiction in terms of the engineering, maintenance, design, and inspection of the pipeline. It's all preempted then, huh? It, it's all preempted by state law. Uh, just as an aside, uh, the other pipelines in the county that uh, lead to these transmission lines uh, from the oil fields, uh, those are in the jurisdiction of the uh, Division of Oil and Gas. Uh, so they handle pipelines under Public Resources Code 3106, except for the large transmission lines which are under the jurisdiction of the state fire marshal. Thank you, sir. Callie, you had a question? I just wanted to verify that there are automatic shutoff valves on both sides of the bridge, the pipeline at the bridge. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. On both the north and the south side of the bridge, there are automatic shutoff valves. Okay. And then my other question, since I'm kind of new to this, is the uh, four-year gap in the CUP. Can you just tell me how that works? Right. Um, regarding the, the time gap between the expiration of the, the previous permit and the application for this permit, the uh, previous applicant was uh, Chevron, and the ownership changed. And uh, this CUP, CUP sort of uh, fell by the wayside. The new owner, uh, Crimson uh, Pipeline, um, they brought it, um, submitted an application. Um, I believe they had initial discussions with uh, county staff as early as uh, 2012. And so it wasn't until just recently the CUP was, application was submitted and that came in um, approximately May of this year. That's correct. Commissioner Rodriguez? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Two things. Um, I drive that road every day, probably. Um, where is the Mandalay hydration plant at, the, at the south end? I mean, I know where the Edison plant is at, or the power plant is at. The Mandalay Bay uh, facility is, well, at the end of the, um, the southern end of the pipeline, uh, sort of on that, uh, the green square at the bottom of the map. I don't know if you can see it from there. But uh, the, the pipeline leaves the Harbor Boulevard right of way, um, turns to the west, and then enters the uh, Mandalay Bay facility. And that's independent from anything uh, going on at the power plant, correct? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Um, that pipeline is completely independent of the power, of the power yes, plant that's there. Correct. Okay, and the CUP uh, was amended for how many to coincide with the franchise? So what are we talking about? I, I read 20 years in there, it's still 20 years? Or has it been amended? Initially, it was uh, 20 years. Okay. Um, however, the, the franchise agreement uh, does expire in uh, 2026. And so, as the, the amended condition reads that um, the CUP term limit would be uh, 2026, um, if, if that is, unless uh, an updated franchise agreement is submitted to the county, in which case this CUP would then um, end in, uh, well, 20 years. Sure. Um, okay. You're right. Thank you. Any other questions to staff? Hearing none, uh, thank you very much, Jane. Uh, disclosures? I know we don't need them, but you drive by it every day, right? I drive by it every day. Steve, did you inspect it today? No, no disclosures. No disclosures from the chair? <laughs> no 
no disclosures. Commissioner Kelly? No disclosures. Thank you very much. All right, then we shall proceed with the public hearing. I open the public hearing. All those who would like to speak on behalf of this, please step forward. Seeing none. All those opposed, please step forward. Seeing none. I will close the public hearing. Any questions, further questions to staff? Are we ready to vote? We can watch the clerk pull her hair out again. I need a motion. Make a motion that we uh, follow recommended staff action. I have a motion to recommend a staff action. Do I have a second? Second. That's Rodriguez and Onsat. So we will. Bucket a bucket a bucket. There we go. If there's no further discussion on the motion, please vote. Please inform Crimson Pipeline that it has been approved 5-0 based on the representations presented today by Exhibit A. All right. Yes. Comment. We had an addendum letter. Was that included in the file? Yeah. Um, okay. to, yeah, that's okay. why I just said Exhibit that's A. That's inclusive in the motion. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next on our agenda is no the planning director on board actions and other matters madam director thank you chair Westner. so just briefly i will go over um, the tentative calendar and it looks like your planning commission will meet again on october 29th um, and then again we've tentatively set a date for december 3rd for the wayne j sand and gravel mine expansion so it's it's the wayne j sand and gravel mine expansion grimes canyon road and then also just to, to update you on a few things that are going forward at the board, October um, 20th, the board will be hearing two things um, from the planning department. One of them is the Santa Rosa Valley Trail general plan amendment that um, your planning commission had heard earlier this year. And another one is the appeal of your planning commission's unanimous vote um, to allow the CRC vintage oil and gas project, the one at Thomas Aquinas College, that was the facility where they had 17 existing and they were planning on putting um, uh, 19 new wells on four existing pads, all which had been reviewed under an EIR. That is being, um, that was appealed and is going to the board on October 20th. And another item that your planning commission heard um, is also being appealed to the board and that is the reasonable accommodation request on the service animals, um, which are pigs in La Conchita. So they're going forward to the appeal that's going to be heard by the board on November 3rd. Yeah. And then also last week, two um, exciting things happened at the board, um, both that your planning commission also weighed in on. One of them was the um, approval of the Satakoy area plan, and that was very well received by the board and the community. There was a lot of great support for that. Um, and so we're going forward and in, in implementing those changes now. And, and uh, I was able to attend the library opening at Satakoy. So there's a new little library out there. And it's great if you ever have any reason to take your grandkids by there. Um, um, it's, a, it's a real nice, nice library and really great for the community. And it has air conditioning. So there was a lot of happy people there that day. It's hot outside. Um, that's, and then, that's at the old Sadakoy hardware store? Yeah, it is. Okay. It's a real great, real great facility. They did an excellent job there, the library services folks. Um, and then the last thing that the, the board also heard that day was the um, conceptual approval of moving forward with the general plan update. And so uh, that's a, a hefty project. Um, we were given some pretty strict marching orders as far as timing, so the timing of that um, really to no later than the, the summer of 2020. So we're hoping to get it to you a little bit earlier than that, just in case something goes wrong. So it's a, it's a project that we're going out for today, an RFP, so we'll be sending that out. Um, moving forward, hopefully getting before the board again in December to um, choose the um, consulting firm that we'll be using, getting the consulting firm on board in January and then really beginning in earnest. So. We're going to be recruiting for um, a couple of new positions, a senior programs person to run the entire program and, and manage that program, and then a senior planner and a tech person to work with them, to work with our consulting firm 
you know, some of the things that, that you guys have discussed, which the board agreed with also to put in the plan is a new standalone um, elements to address water, to address agriculture, and to address economic development. And then themes to be woven through the document are um, healthy communities to address the county's health and all policy adopted by the board, and sustainability, you know, what are we going to do to be able to maintain, you know, water and other essential services um, for the next 20 years plus. So it's a very big project. The board has um, directed a lot of that initial work to be vetted through the Planning Commission, so we'll be here many, many, many times over the next four and a half years to um, touch base and get your feeling and your direction on where we're going and there'll probably be uh, another maybe joint uh, meeting with the planning or with the planning commission and the board and then we'll be taking what you have to say to the board just to make sure we're stopping and checking at the appropriate times because we don't want to get too far out ahead and have to reverse course. It's a, it seems like a long time, four and a half years, but it's very lightning speed to address those big issues, but we're excited about it. And so um, the more I know and as I know things, I'll be, I'll be updating your commission each time we meet. So that's all I have. If you have anything for me. Item number 10, uh, B, B, commission, anything you'd like to introduce? No. No. <laughs> There's no budget for meals for you. Sorry about that. Uh, I am surprised that uh, four and a half years. I thought it was going to be 36 months on the general plan update. We did go to the board and we did explore that. They asked us to. And, and so we, we gave a kind of a presentation of we can do it and, and here's the things that would kind of fall off because you do have to pick and choose at that stage um, for a three-year project. So no, they, they decided uh, more like a four and a half year project. Okay. All right. If there's nothing else for the good of the order, this commission is adjourned. We shall see you on the 29th. Oh, this commission is adjourned in honor of uh, breast cancer awareness today.